The Dark Cosmos presents The Gods of Mars, Part 2, written by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This time, we'll cover chapters 12 through 22 in this story. This classic dark sci-fi and fantasy tale was first published in 1913 in the All Story magazine. Sit back, relax, and unwind for the next few hours with this classic sci-fi story that continues with Carter pulled into a whirlwind of deceit, mythical entities, and deadly confrontations as he seeks to unveil the reality behind the supposed divine realm. Are you ready? Let's begin. Chapter 12 Doomed to Die For an instant I stood there before they fell upon me, but the first rush of them forced me back a step or two. My foot felt for the floor, but found only empty space. I had backed into the pit which had received Issus. For a second, I toppled there upon the brink. Then I too, with the boy still tightly clutched in my arms, pitched backward into the black abyss. We struck a polished chute, the opening above us closed as magically as it had opened, and we shot down, unharmed, into a dimly lighted apartment far below the arena. As I rose to my feet, the first thing I saw was the malignant countenance of Issus glaring at me through the heavy bars of a grated door at one side of the chamber. Rash mortal, she shrilled, you shall pay the awful penalty for your blasphemy in this secret cell. Here you shall lie alone, and in darkness with the carcass of your accomplice, festering in its rottenness by your side, until crazed by loneliness and hunger, you feed upon the crawling maggots that were once a man. That was all. In another instant she was gone, and the dim light which had filled the cell faded into Cimmerian blackness. Pleasant old lady, said a voice at my side. Who speaks? I asked. "'Tis I, your companion, who has had the honour this day of fighting shoulder to shoulder with the greatest warrior that ever wore metal upon Barsoom." "'I thank God that you are not dead,' I said. "'I feared for that nasty cut upon your head.' "'It but stunned me,' he replied. "'A mere scratch.' "'Maybe it were as well had it been final,' I said. "'We seem to be in a pretty fix here with a splendid chance of dying of starvation and thirst.' Where are we? Beneath the arena, I replied. We tumbled down the shaft that swallowed Issus as she was almost at our mercy. He laughed a low laugh of pleasure and relief, and then reaching out through the inky blackness, he sought my shoulder and pulled my ear close to his mouth. Nothing could be better, he whispered. There are secrets within the secrets of Issus, of which Issus herself does not dream. What do you mean? I laboured with the other slaves a year since in the remodelling of these subterranean galleries, and at that time we found below these an ancient system of corridors and chambers that had been sealed up for ages. The blacks in charge of the work explored them, taking several of us along to do whatever work there might be occasion for. I know the entire system perfectly. There are miles of corridors honeycombing the ground beneath the gardens and the temple itself, and there is one passage that leads down to and connects with the lower regions that open on the water shaft that gives passage to Omean. If we can reach the submarine undetected, we may yet make the sea in which there are many islands where the blacks never go. There we may live for a time, and who knows what may transpire to aid us to escape. He had spoken all in a low whisper, evidently fearing spying ears even here, and so I answered him in the same subdued tone. Lead back to Shada, my friend, I whispered. Zoda, the black, is there. We were to attempt our escape together, so I cannot desert him. No, said the boy, one cannot desert a friend. It were better to be recaptured ourselves than that. Then he commenced groping his way about the floor of the dark chamber, searching for the trap that led to the corridors beneath. At length he summoned me by a low E-C-S-T, and I crept toward the sound of his voice to find him kneeling on the brink of an opening in the floor. There is a drop here of about ten feet, he whispered. Hang by your hands, and you will alight safely on a level floor of soft sand. Very quietly, I lowered myself from the inky cell above into the inky pit below. So utterly dark was it, 
that we could not see our hands at an inch from our noses. Never, I think, have I known such complete absence of light as existed in the pits of Issus. For an instant, I hung in mid-air. There is a strange sensation connected with an experience of that nature which is quite difficult to describe. When the feet tread empty air and the distance below is shrouded in darkness, there is a feeling akin to panic at the thought of releasing the hold and taking the plunge into unknown depths. Although the boy had told me that it was but ten feet to the floor below, I experienced the same thrills as though I were hanging above a bottomless pit. Then I released my hold and dropped, four feet to a soft cushion of sand. The boy followed me. Raise me to your shoulders, he said, and I will replace the trap. This done, he took me by the hand, leading me very slowly, with much feeling about and frequent halts, to assure himself that he did not stray into wrong passageways. Presently, we commenced the descent of a very steep incline. It will not be long, he said, before we shall have light. At the lower levels, we meet the same stratum of phosphorescent rock that illuminates Omean. Never shall I forget that trip through the pits of Issus. While it was devoid of important incidents, yet it was filled for me with a strange charm of excitement and adventure, which I think must have hinged principally on the unguessable antiquity of these long-forgotten corridors. The things which the Stygian darkness hid from my objective eye could not have been half so wonderful as the pictures which my imagination wrought as it conjured to life again the ancient peoples of this dying world and set them once more to the labours, the intrigues, the mysteries and the cruelties which they had practised to make their last stand against the swarming hordes of the dead sea bottoms that had driven them step by step to the uttermost pinnacle of the world where they were now entrenched behind an impenetrable barrier of superstition. In addition to the green men, there had been three principal races upon Barsoom, the blacks, the whites, and a race of yellow men. As the waters of the planet dried and the seas receded, all other resources dwindled until life upon the planet became a constant battle for survival. The various races had made war upon one another for ages, and the three higher types had easily bested the green savages of the water places of the world, but now that the receding seas necessitated constant abandonment of their fortified cities and forced upon them a more or less nomadic life, in which they became separated into smaller communities, they soon fell prey to the fierce hordes of green men. The result was a partial amalgamation of the blacks, whites and yellows, the result of which is shown in the present splendid race of red men. I had always supposed that all traces of the original races had disappeared from the face of Mars, yet within the past four days I had found both whites and blacks in great multitudes. Could it be possible that in some far-off corner of the planet there still existed a remnant of the ancient race of yellow men? My reveries were broken in upon by a low exclamation from the boy. At last, the lighted way, he cried, and looking up, I beheld at a long distance before us a dim radiance. As we advanced, the light increased until presently we emerged into well-lighted passageways. From then on, our progress was rapid until we came suddenly to the end of a corridor that led directly upon the ledge surrounding the pool of the submarine. The craft lay at her moorings with uncovered hatch. Raising his finger to his lips and then tapping his sword in a significant manner, the youth crept noiselessly toward the vessel. I was close at his heels. Silently, we dropped to the deserted deck and on hands and knees crawled toward the hatchway. A stealthy glance below revealed no guard in sight, and so with the quickness and the soundlessness of cats, we dropped together into the main cabin of the submarine. Even here was no sign of life. Quickly, we covered and secured the hatch. Then the boy stepped into the pilot house, touched a button, and the boat sank amid swirling waters toward the bottom of the shaft. Even then, there was no scurrying of feet as we had expected, and while the boy remained to direct the boat, I slid from cabin to cabin in futile search for some member of the crew. The craft was entirely deserted. 
such good fortune seemed almost unbelievable. When I returned to the pilot house to report the good news to my companion, he handed me a paper. This may explain the absence of the crew, he said. It was a radio aerial message to the commander of the submarine. The slaves have risen. Come with what men you have and those that you can gather on the way. Too late to get aid from a man. They are massacring all within the amphitheater. Issus is threatened. Haste. Zythad. Zythad is data of the guards of Issus, explained the youth. We gave them a bad scare, one that they will not soon forget. Let us hope that it is but the beginning of the end of Issus, I said. Only our first ancestor knows, he replied. We reached the submarine pool in Omean without incident. Here, we debated the wisdom of sinking the craft before leaving her, but finally decided that it would add nothing to our chances for escape. There were plenty of blacks on Omean to thwart us where we apprehended. However many more might come from the temples and gardens of Issus would not in any way decrease our chances. We were now in a quandary as to how to pass the guards who patrolled the island about the pool. At last, I hit upon a plan. What is the name or title of the officer in charge of these guards? I asked the boy. A fellow named Torith was on duty when we entered this morning, he replied. Good. And what is the name of the commander of the submarine? Yersted. I found a dispatch blank in the cabin and wrote the following order. Data Torith. Return these two slaves at once to Shudder. Yersted. That will be the simpler way to return, I said, smiling as I handed the forged order to the boy. Come, we shall see now how well it works. But our swords, he exclaimed. What shall we say to explain them? Since we cannot explain them, we shall have to leave them behind us, I replied. Is it not the extreme of rashness to thus put ourselves again, unarmed, in the power of the firstborn? It is the only way, I answered. You may trust me to find a way out of the prison of Shadda, and I think, once out, that we shall find no great difficulty in arming ourselves once more in a country which abounds so plentifully in armed men. As you say, he replied with a smile and shrug, I could not follow another leader who inspired greater confidence than you. Come, let us put your ruse to the test. Boldly, we emerged from the hatchway of the craft, leaving our swords behind us and strode to the main exit, which led to the sentry's post and the office of the data of the guard. At sight of us, the members of the guard sprang forward in surprise, and with leveled rifles halted us. I held out the message to one of them. He took it, and seeing to whom it was addressed, turned and handed it to Torith, who was emerging from his office to learn the cause of the commotion. The black read the order, and for a moment eyed us with evident suspicion. Where is Data Yersted? he asked, and my heart sank within me as I cursed myself for a stupid fool in not having sunk the submarine to make good the lie that I must tell. His orders were to return immediately to the temple landing, I replied. Torith took a half step toward the entrance to the pool as though to corroborate my story. For that instant, Everything hung in the balance, for had he done so, and found the empty submarine still lying at her wharf, the whole weak fabric of my concoction would have tumbled about our heads. But evidently he decided the message must be genuine, nor indeed was there any good reason to doubt it, since it would scarce have seemed credible to him that two slaves would voluntarily have given themselves into custody in any such manner as this. It was the very boldness of the plan which rendered it successful. Were you connected with the rising of the slaves? asked Torith. We have just had meagre reports of some such event. All were involved, I replied. But it amounted to little. The guards quickly overcame and killed the majority of us. He seemed satisfied with this reply. Take them to Shador, he ordered, turning to one of his subordinates. We entered a small boat lying beside the island, and in a few minutes were disembarking upon Shador. Here we were returned to our respective cells, I with Zodar, the boy by himself, and behind locked doors we were again prisoners of the firstborn. Chapter 13 A Break for Liberty 
Xodar listened in incredulous astonishment to my narration of the events which had transpired within the arena at the rites of Issus. He could scarce conceive, even though he had already professed his doubt as to the deity of Issus, that one could threaten her with sword in hand and not be blasted into a thousand fragments by the mere fury of her divine wrath. It is the final proof, he said at last. No more is needed to completely shatter the last remnant of my superstitious belief in the divinity of Issus. She is only a wicked old woman, wielding a mighty power for evil through machinations that have kept her own people and all Barsoom in religious ignorance for ages. She is still all-powerful here, however, I replied, so it behooves us to leave at the first moment that appears at all propitious. I hope that you may find a propitious moment, he said with a laugh, for it is certain that in all my life I have never seen one in which a prisoner of the firstborn might escape. Tonight will do as well as any, I replied. It will soon be night, said Zodar. How may I aid in the adventure? Can you swim? I asked him. No slimy Scyllian that haunts the depths of Chorus is more at home in water than is Zodar, he replied. Good. The Red One in all probability cannot swim, I said, since there is scarce enough water in all their domains to float the tiniest craft. One of us, therefore, will have to support him through the sea to the craft we select. I had hoped that we might make the entire distance below the surface, but I fear that the red youth could not thus perform the trip. Even the bravest of the brave among them are terrorized at the mere thought of deep water, for it has been ages since their forebears saw a lake, a river, or a sea. The red one is to accompany us, asked Zodar. Yes, it is well. Three swords are better than two, especially when the third is as mighty as this fellow's. I have seen him battle in the arena at the rites of Issus many times. Never, until I saw you fight, had I seen one who seemed unconquerable, even in the face of great odds. One might think you two master and pupil or father and son. Come to recall his face, there is a resemblance between you. It is very marked when you fight. There is the same grim smile, the same maddening contempt for your adversary apparent in every movement of your bodies and in every changing expression of your faces. Be that as it may, Zodar, he is a great fighter. I think that we will make a trio difficult to overcome, and if my friend Tars Tarkas, Jeddak of Thark, were but one of us, we could fight our way from one end of Barsoom to the other, even though the whole world were pitted against us. It will be, said Zodar when they find from whence you have come. That is but one of the superstitions which Issus has foisted upon a credulous humanity. She works through the holy therns, who are as ignorant of her real self as are the Barsoomians of the outer world. Her decrees are born to the therns written in blood upon a strange parchment. The poor deluded fools think that they are receiving the revelations of a goddess through some supernatural agency, since they find these messages upon their guarded altars to which none could have access without detection. I myself have borne these messages for Issus for many years. There is a long tunnel from the temple of Issus to the principal temple of Matai Shang. It was dug ages ago by the slaves of the firstborn in such utter secrecy that no thern ever guessed its existence. The therns, for their part, have temples dotted about the entire civilized world. Here, priests whom the people never see communicate the doctrine of the mysterious river Iss, the Valley Door, and the Lost Sea of Chorus to persuade the poor deluded creatures to take the voluntary pilgrimage that swells the wealth of the holy therns and adds to the numbers of their slaves. Thus the therns are used as the principal means for collecting the wealth and labor that the firstborn wrest from them as they need it. Occasionally, the firstborn themselves make raids upon the outer world. It is then that they capture many females of the royal houses of the red men and take the newest in battleships and the trained artisans who build them that they may copy what they cannot create. We are a non-productive race, priding ourselves upon our non-productiveness. It is criminal for a firstborn to labor or invent. That is the work of the lower orders, who live merely that the firstborn may enjoy long lives of luxury and idleness. With us fighting is all that counts. 
Were it not for that there would be more of the firstborn than all the creatures of Barsoom could support, for in so far as I know none of us ever dies a natural death. Our females would live forever, but for the fact that we tire of them and remove them to make place for others. Issus alone of all is protected against death. She has lived for countless ages. Would not the other Barsoomians live forever, but for the doctrine of the voluntary pilgrimage which drags them to the bosom of Iesses at or before their thousandth year, I asked him. I feel now that there is no doubt but that they are precisely the same species of creature as the firstborn, and I hope that I shall live to fight for them in atonement of the sins I have committed against them through the ignorance born of generations of false teaching. As he ceased speaking, a weird call rang out across the waters of Omean. I had heard it at the same time the previous evening, and knew that it marked the ending of the day, when the men of Omean spread their silks upon the deck of battleship and cruiser, and fall into the dreamless sleep of Mars. Our guard entered to inspect us for the last time before the new day broke upon the world above. His duty was soon performed, and the heavy door of our prison closed behind him. We were alone for the night. I gave him time to return to his quarters, as Zodar said he probably would do. Then I sprang to the grated window and surveyed the nearby waters. At a little distance from the island, a quarter of a mile perhaps, lay a monster battleship, while between her and the shore were a number of smaller cruisers and one-man scouts. Upon the battleship alone was there a watch. I could see him plainly in the upper works of the ship, and as I watched, I saw him spread his sleeping silks upon the tiny platform in which he was stationed. Soon he threw himself at full length upon his couch. The discipline on Omean was lax indeed, but it is not to be wondered at since no enemy guessed the existence upon Barsoom of such a fleet, or even of the firstborn, or the sea of Omean. Why indeed should they maintain a watch? Presently, I dropped to the floor again and talked with Zodar, describing the various craft I had seen. There is one there, he said. My personal property, built to carry five men, that is the swiftest of the swift. If we can board her, we can at least make a memorable run for liberty. And then he went on to describe to me the equipment of the boat, her engines, and all that went to make her the flyer that she was. In his explanation, I recognized a trick of gearing that Kantos Khan had taught me that time we sailed under false names in the navy of Zodanga beneath Sabthan, the prince. And I knew then that the firstborn had stolen it from the ships of Helium, for only they are thus geared. And I knew too that Zodar spoke the truth when he lauded the speed of his little craft, for nothing that cleaves the thin air of Mars can approximate the speed of the ships of Helium. We decided to wait for an hour at least, until all the stragglers had sought their silks. In the meantime, I was to fetch the red youth to our cell, so that we would be in readiness to make our rash break for freedom together. I sprang to the top of our partition wall and pulled myself up onto it. There I found a flat surface about a foot in width, and along this I walked until I came to the cell in which I saw the boy sitting upon his bench. He had been leaning back against the wall, looking up at the glowing dome above Omean, and when he spied me balancing upon the partition wall above him, his eyes opened wide in astonishment. Then a wide grin of appreciative understanding spread across his countenance. As I stooped to drop to the floor beside him, he motioned me to wait, and coming close below me, whispered, Catch my hand! I can almost leap to the top of that wall myself. I have tried it many times and each day I come a little closer. Some day I should have been able to make it. I lay upon my belly across the wall and reached my hand far down toward him. With a little run from the center of the cell, he sprang up until I grasped his outstretched hand, and thus I pulled him to the wall's top beside me. You're the first jumper I ever saw among the red men of Barsoom, I said. He smiled. It is not strange. I will tell you why when we have more time. Together, we returned to the cell in which Zodar sat, descending to talk with him until the hour had passed. There we made our plans for the immediate future, binding ourselves by a solemn oath to fight to the death for one another against whatsoever enemies should confront us. 
for we knew that even should we succeed in escaping the firstborn, we might still have a whole world against us. The power of religious superstition is mighty. It was agreed that I should navigate the craft after we had reached her, and that if we made the outer world in safety, we should attempt to reach Helium without a stop. Why Helium? asked the Red Youth. I am a prince of Helium, I replied. He gave me a peculiar look, but said nothing further on the subject. I wondered at the time what the significance of his expression might be, but in the press of other matters it soon left my mind, nor did I have occasion to think of it again until later. Come, I said at length, now is as good a time as any. Let us go. Another moment found me at the top of the partition wall again with the boy beside me. Unbuckling my harness, I snapped it together with a single long strap, which I lowered to the waiting Zodar below. He grasped the end and was soon sitting beside us. How simple, he laughed. The balance should be even simpler, I replied. Then I raised myself to the top of the outer wall of the prison, just so that I could peer over and locate the passing sentry. For a matter of five minutes I waited, and then he came in sight on his slow and snail-like beat about the structure. I watched him until he had made the turn at the end of the building which carried him out of sight of the side of the prison that was to witness our dash for freedom. The moment his form disappeared, I grasped Zodar and drew him to the top of the wall. Placing one end of my harness strap in his hands, I lowered him quickly to the ground below. Then the boy grasped the strap and slid down to Zodar's side. In accordance with our arrangement, they did not wait for me, but walked slowly toward the water, a matter of a hundred yards, directly past the guardhouse filled with sleeping soldiers. They had taken scarce a dozen steps when I too dropped to the ground and followed them leisurely toward the shore. As I passed the guardhouse, the thought of all the good blades lying there gave me pause, for if ever men were to have need of swords, it was my companions and I on the perilous trip upon which we were about to embark. I glanced toward Zodar and the youth, and saw that they had slipped over the edge of the dock into the water. In accordance with our plan, they were to remain there clinging to the metal rings which studded the concrete-like substance of the dock at the water's level, with only their mouths and noses above the surface of the sea, until I should join them. The lure of the swords within the guardhouse was strong upon me, and I hesitated a moment, half inclined to risk the attempt to take the few we needed. That he who hesitates is lost proved itself a true aphorism in this instance, for another moment saw me creeping stealthily toward the door of the guardhouse. Gently I pressed it open a crack, enough to discover a dozen blacks stretched upon their silks in profound slumber. At the far side of the room, a rack held the swords and firearms of the men. Warily, I pushed the door a trifle wider to admit my body. A hinge gave out a resentful groan. One of the men stirred, and my heart stood still. I cursed myself for a fool to have thus jeopardized our chances for escape. But there was nothing for it now but to see the adventure through. With a spring as swift and as noiseless as a tiger's, I lit beside the guardsman who had moved. My hands hovered about his throat, awaiting the moment that his eyes should open. For what seemed an eternity to my overwrought nerves, I remained poised thus. Then the fellow turned again upon his side and resumed the even respiration of deep slumber. Carefully, I picked my way between and over the soldiers until I had gained the rack at the far side of the room. Here I turned to survey the sleeping men. All were quiet. Their regular breathing rose and fell in a soothing rhythm that seemed to me the sweetest music I ever had heard. Gingerly, I drew a long sword from the rack. The scraping of the scabbard against its holder as I withdrew it sounded like the filing of cast iron with a great rasp, and I looked to see the room immediately filled with alarmed and attacking guardsmen, but none stirred. The second sword I withdrew noiselessly, but the third clanked in its scabbard with a frightful din. I knew that it must awaken some of the men at least, and was on the point of forestalling their attack by a rapid charge for the doorway, when again, to my intense surprise, not a black moved. 
Either they were wondrous heavy sleepers, or else the noises that I made were really much less than they seemed to me. I was about to leave the rack when my attention was attracted by the revolvers. I knew that I could not carry more than one away with me, for I was already too heavily laden to move quietly with any degree of safety or speed. As I took one of them from its pin, my eye fell for the first time on an open window beside the rack. Ah, here was a splendid means of escape, for it let directly upon the dock, not twenty feet from the water's edge. And as I congratulated myself, I heard the door opposite me open, and there looking me full in the face stood the officer of the guard. He evidently took in the situation at a glance, and appreciated the gravity of it as quickly as I, for our revolvers came up simultaneously, and the sounds of the two reports were as one as we touched the buttons on the grips that exploded the cartridges. I felt the wind of his bullet as it whizzed past my ear, and at the same instant I saw him crumple to the ground. Where I hit him, I do not know, nor if I killed him, for scarce had he started to collapse when I was through the window at my rear. In another second the waters of a man closed above my head, and the three of us were making for the little flyer a hundred yards away. Zodar was burdened with the boy, and I with the three long swords, the revolver I had dropped, so that while we were both strong swimmers, it seemed to me that we moved at a snail's pace through the water. I was swimming entirely beneath the surface, but Zodar was compelled to rise often to let the youth breathe, so it was a wonder that we were not discovered long before we were. In fact, we reached the boat side, and were all aboard before the watch upon the battleship, aroused by the shots, detected us. Then an alarm gun bellowed from a ship's bow, its deep boom reverberating in deafening tones beneath the rocky dome of a man. Instantly the sleeping thousands were awake. The decks of a thousand monster craft teemed with fighting men, for an alarm on Oman was a thing of rare occurrence. We cast away before the sound of the first gun had died, and another second saw us rising swiftly from the surface of the sea. I lay at full length along the deck with the levers and buttons of control before me. Xodar and the boy were stretched directly behind me, prone also that we might offer as little resistance to the air as possible. Rise high, whispered Zodar. They dare not fire their heavy guns toward the dome. The fragments of the shells would drop back among their own craft. If we are high enough, our keel plates will protect us from rifle fire. I did as he bade. Below us, we could see the men leaping into the water by hundreds and striking out for the small cruisers and one-man flyers that lay moored about the big ships. The larger craft were getting under way, following us rapidly but not rising from the water. A little to your right, cried Zodar, for there are no points of compass upon a man where every direction is due north. The pandemonium that had broken out below us was deafening. Rifles cracked, officers shouted orders, men yelled directions to one another from the water and from the decks of myriad boats, while through all ran the purr of countless propellers cutting water and air, I had not dared pull my speed lever to the highest for fear of overrunning the mouth of the shaft that passed from Omean's dome to the world above, but even so we were hitting a clip that I doubt has ever been equalled on the windless sea. The smaller flyers were commencing to rise toward us when Zodar shouted, The shaft! The shaft! Dead ahead! And I saw the opening, black and yawning in the glowing dome of this underworld. A ten-man cruiser was rising directly in front to cut off our escape. It was the only vessel that stood in our way, but at the rate that it was travelling, it would come between us and the shaft in plenty of time to thwart our plans. It was rising at an angle of about forty-five degrees dead ahead of us, with the evident intention of combing us with grappling hooks from above as it skimmed low over our deck. There was but one forlorn hope for us, and I took it. It was useless to try to pass over her, for that would have allowed her to force us against the rocky dome above, and we were already too near that as it was. To have attempted to dive below her would have put us entirely at her mercy, and precisely where she wanted us. On either side, a hundred other menacing craft were hastening toward us. The alternative was filled with risk. In fact, it was all risk, 
with but a slender chance of success. As we neared the cruiser, I rose as though to pass above her, so that she would do just what she did do, rise at a steeper angle to force me still higher. Then, as we were almost upon her, I yelled to my companions to hold tight, and throwing the little vessel into her highest speed, I deflected her bows at the same instant until we were running horizontally and at terrific velocity straight for the cruiser's keel. Her commander may have seen my intentions then, but it was too late. Almost at the instant of impact, I turned my bows upward, and then with a shattering jolt we were in collision. What I had hoped for happened. The cruiser, already tilted at a perilous angle, was carried completely over backward by the impact of my smaller vessel. Her crew fell twisting and screaming through the air to the water far below, while the cruiser, her propellers still madly churning, dived swiftly head foremost after them to the bottom of the Sea of Omean. The collision crushed our steel bows, and notwithstanding every effort on our part, came near to hurling us from the deck. As it was, we landed in a wildly clutching heap at the very extremity of the flyer, where Zodar and I succeeded in grasping the handrail, but the boy would have plunged overboard had I not fortunately grasped his ankle as he was already partially over. Unguided, our vessel careened wildly in its mad flight, rising ever nearer the rocks above. It took but an instant, however, for me to regain the levers, and with the roof barely fifty feet above, I turned her nose once more into the horizontal plane and headed her again for the black mouth of the shaft. The collision had retarded our progress, and now a hundred swift scouts were close upon us. Xodar had told me that ascending the shaft by virtue of our repulsive rays alone would give our enemies their best chance to overtake us, since our propellers would be idle, and in rising we would be outclassed by many of our pursuers. The swifter craft are seldom equipped with large buoyancy tanks, since the added bulk of them tends to reduce a vessel's speed. As many boats were now quite close to us, it was inevitable that we would be quickly overhauled in the shaft and captured or killed in short order. To me, there always seems a way to gain the opposite side of an obstacle. If one cannot pass over it, or below it, or around it, why then there is but a single alternative left, and that is to pass through it. I could not get around the fact that many of these other boats could rise faster than ours by the fact of their greater buoyancy, but I was nonetheless determined to reach the outer world far in advance of them, or die a death of my own choosing in event of failure. Reverse! screamed Zodar behind me. For the love of your first ancestor, reverse! We are at the shaft! Hold tight! I screamed in reply. Grasp the boy and hold tight. We are going straight up the shaft. The words were scarce out of my mouth as we swept beneath the pitch-black opening. I threw the bow hard up, dragged the speed lever to its last notch, and clutching a stanchion with one hand and the steering wheel with the other, hung on like grim death and consigned my soul to its author. I heard a little exclamation of surprise from Zodar, followed by a grim laugh. The boy laughed too and said something which I could not catch for the whistling of the wind of our awful speed. I looked above my head, hoping to catch the gleam of stars by which I could direct our course and hold the hurtling thing that bore us true to the center of the shaft. To have touched the side at the speed we were making would doubtless have resulted in instant death for us all. But not a star showed above, only utter and impenetrable darkness. Then I glanced below me, and there I saw a rapidly diminishing circle of light, the mouth of the opening above the phosphorescent radiance of Omean. By this I steered, endeavouring to keep the circle of light below me ever perfect. At best, it was but a slender cord that held us from destruction, and I think that I steered that night more by intuition and blind faith than by skill or reason. We were not long in the shaft, and possibly the very fact of our enormous speed saved us, for evidently we started in the right direction, and so quickly were we out again that we had no time to alter our course. Omean lies perhaps two miles below the surface crust of Mars. Our speed must have approximated 200 miles an hour, for Martian flyers are swift, so that at most we were in the shaft not over 40 seconds. 
We must have been out of it for some seconds before I realized that we had accomplished the impossible. Black darkness enshrouded all about us. There were neither moons nor stars. Never before had I seen such a thing upon Mars, and for the moment I was nonplussed. Then the explanation came to me. It was summer at the South Pole. The ice cap was melting and those meteoric phenomena, clouds unknown upon the greater part of Barsoom, were shutting out the light of heaven from this portion of the planet. Fortunate indeed it was for us, nor did it take me long to grasp the opportunity for escape which this happy condition offered us. Keeping the boat's nose at a stiff angle, I raced her for the impenetrable curtain which nature had hung above this dying world to shut us out from the sight of our pursuing enemies. We plunged through the cold, damp fog without diminishing our speed, and in a moment emerged into the glorious light of the two moons and the million stars. I dropped into a horizontal course and headed due north. Our enemies were a good half hour behind us with no conception of our direction. We had performed the miraculous and come through a thousand dangers unscathed. We had escaped from the land of the firstborn. No other prisoners in all the ages of Barsoom had done this thing, and now, as I looked back upon it, it did not seem to have been so difficult after all. I said as much to Zodar over my shoulder. It is very wonderful, nevertheless, he replied. No one else could have accomplished it but John Carter. At the sound of that name, the boy jumped to his feet. John Carter, he cried. John Carter! Why, man, John Carter! Prince of Helium has been dead for years. I am his son. Chapter 14 The Eyes in the Dark My son! I could not believe my ears. Slowly I rose and faced the handsome youth. Now that I looked at him closely, I commenced to see why his face and personality had attracted me so strongly. There was much of his mother's incomparable beauty in his clear-cut features, but it was strongly masculine beauty, and his grey eyes and the expression of them were mine. The boy stood facing me, half hope and half uncertainty in his look. Tell me of your mother, I said. Tell me all you can of the years that I have been robbed by a relentless fate of her dear companionship. With a cry of pleasure, he sprang toward me and threw his arms about my neck, and for a brief moment as I held my boy close to me, the tears welled to my eyes, and I was like to have choked after the manner of some maudlin fool, but I do not regret it, nor am I ashamed. A long life has taught me that a man may seem weak where women and children are concerned, and yet be anything but a weakling in the sterner avenues of life. Your stature, your manner, the terrible ferocity of your swordsmanship, said the boy, are as my mother has described them to me a thousand times, but even with such evidence I could scarce credit the truth of what seemed so improbable to me, however much I desired it to be true. Do you know what thing it was that convinced me more than all the others? What, my boy? I asked. Your first words to me, they were of my mother. None else but the man who loved her as she has told me my father did would have thought first of her. For long years, my son, I can scarce recall a moment that the radiant vision of your mother's face has not been ever before me. Tell me of her. Those who have known her longest say that she has not changed, unless it be to grow more beautiful. Were that possible? Only, when she thinks I am not about to see her, her face grows very sad, and oh, so wistful. She thinks ever of you, my father, and all Helium mourns with her and for her. Her grandfather's people love her. They loved you also, and fairly worship your memory as the saviour of Barsoom. Each year that brings its anniversary of the day that saw you racing across a near-dead world to unlock the secret of that awful portal behind which lay the mighty power of life for countless millions, a great festival is held in your honour. But there are tears mingled with the thanksgiving, tears of real regret that the author of the happiness is not with them to share the joy of living he died to give them. Upon all Barsoom, there is no greater name than John Carter. And by what name has your mother called you, my boy? I asked. The people of Helium asked that I be named with my father's name, 
But my mother said no, that you and she had chosen a name for me together, and that your wish must be honored before all others. So the name that she called me is the one that you desired, a combination of hers and yours, Carthoris. Zodar had been at the wheel as I talked with my son, and now he called me. She is dropping badly by the head, John Carter, he said. So long as we were rising at a stiff angle, it was not noticeable, but now that I am trying to keep a horizontal course, it is different. The wound in her bow has opened one of her forward ray tanks. It was true, and after I had examined the damage, I found it a much graver matter than I had anticipated. Not only was the forced angle at which we were compelled to maintain the bow in order to keep a horizontal course greatly impeding our speed, but at the rate that we were losing our repulsive rays from the forward tanks, it was but a question of an hour or more when we would be floating stern up and helpless. We had slightly reduced our speed with the dawning of a sense of security, but now I took the helm once more and pulled the noble little engine wide open so that again we raced north at terrific velocity. In the meantime, Carthoris and Xodar, with tools in hand, were puttering with the great rent in the bow in a hopeless endeavor to stem the tide of escaping rays. It was still dark when we passed the northern boundary of the ice cap and the area of clouds. Below us lay a typical Martian landscape, rolling ochre sea bottom of long, dead seas, low surrounding hills, with here and there the grim and silent cities of the dead past, great piles of mighty architecture tenanted only by age-old memories of a once powerful race and by the great white apes of Barsoom. It was becoming more and more difficult to maintain our little vessel in a horizontal position. Lower and lower sagged the bow until it became necessary to stop the engine to prevent our flight terminating in a swift dive to the ground. As the sun rose and the light of a new day swept away the darkness of night, our craft gave a final spasmodic plunge, turned half upon her side, and then with deck tilting at a sickening angle swung in a slow circle, her bow dropping further below her stern each moment. To handrail and stanchion we clung, and finally, as we saw the end approaching, snapped the buckles of our harness to the rings at her sides. In another moment, the deck reared at an angle of ninety degrees, and we hung in our leather with feet dangling a thousand yards above the ground. I was swinging quite close to the controlling devices, so I reached out to the lever that directed the rays of repulsion. The boat responded to the touch, and very gently we began to sink toward the ground. It was fully half an hour before we touched. Directly north of us rose a rather lofty range of hills, toward which we decided to make our way, since they afforded greater opportunity for concealment from the pursuers we were confident might stumble in this direction. An hour later found us in the time-rounded gullies of the hills, amid the beautiful flowering plants that abound in the arid waste places of Barsoom. There we found numbers of huge milk-giving shrubs, that strange plant which serves in great part as food and drink for the wild hordes of green men. It was indeed a boon to us, for we all were nearly famished. Beneath a cluster of these, which afforded perfect concealment from wandering air scouts, we lay down to sleep, for me the first time in many hours. This was the beginning of my fifth day upon Barsoom, since I had found myself suddenly translated from my cottage on the Hudson to Dor, the valley beautiful, the valley hideous. In all this time I had slept but twice, though once the clock around within the storehouse of the Therns, it was mid-afternoon when I was awakened by someone seizing my hand and covering it with kisses. With a start, I opened my eyes to look into the beautiful face of Thuvia. My prince! My prince! she cried in an ecstasy of happiness. Tis you whom I had mourned as dead. My ancestors have been good to me. I have not lived in vain. The girl's voice awoke Zodar and Carthoris. The boy gazed upon the woman in surprise, but she did not seem to realize the presence of another than I. She would have thrown her arms about my neck and smothered me with caresses had I not gently but firmly disengaged myself. Come, come, Thuvia, I said soothingly. 
You are overwrought by the danger and hardships you have passed through. You forget yourself, as you forget that I am the husband of the Princess of Helium. I forget nothing, my prince, she replied. You have spoken no word of love to me, nor do I expect that you ever shall. But nothing can prevent me loving you. I would not take the place of Deja Thoris. My greatest ambition is to serve you, my prince, forever as your slave. No greater boon could I ask, no greater honor could I crave, no greater happiness could I hope. As I have before said, I am no lady's man, and I must admit that I seldom have felt so uncomfortable and embarrassed as I did that moment. While I was quite familiar with the Martian custom, which allows female slaves to Martian men, whose high and chivalrous honor is always ample protection for every woman in his household, yet I had never myself chosen other than men as my body servants. And I ever return to Helium Thuvia, I said. You shall go with me, but as an honored equal, and not as a slave. There you shall find plenty of handsome young nobles who would face Issus herself to win a smile from you, and we shall have you married in short order to one of the best of them. Forget your foolish gratitude begotten infatuation, which your innocence has mistaken for love. I like your friendship better, Thuvia. You are my master. It shall be as you say, she replied simply, but there was a note of sadness in her voice. How came you here, Thuvia? I asked. And where is Tars Tarkas? The great Thark, I fear, is dead, she replied sadly. He was a mighty fighter, but a multitude of green warriors of another horde than his overwhelmed him. The last that I saw of him, they were bearing him, wounded and bleeding, to the deserted city from which they had sallied to attack us. You are not sure that he is dead, then? I asked. And where is this city of which you speak? It is just beyond this range of hills. The vessel in which you so nobly resigned a place that we might find escape defied our small skill in navigation, with the result that we drifted aimlessly about for two days. Then we decided to abandon the craft and attempt to make our way on foot to the nearest waterway. Yesterday we crossed these hills and came upon the dead city beyond. We had passed within its streets and were walking toward the central portion, when at an intersecting avenue we saw a body of green warriors approaching. Tars Tarkas was in advance, and they saw him, but me they did not see. The Thark sprang back to my side and forced me into an adjacent doorway, where he told me to remain in hiding until I could escape, making my way to Helium if possible. There will be no escape for me now, he said, for these be the war hoon of the South. When they have seen my metal, it will be to the death. Then he stepped out to meet them. Ah, my prince, such fighting. For an hour they swarmed about him, until the war hoon dead formed a hill where he had stood. But at last they overwhelmed him, those behind pushing the foremost upon him until there remained no space to swing his great sword. Then he stumbled and went down, and they rolled over him like a huge wave. When they carried him away toward the heart of the city, he was dead, I think, for I did not see him move. Before we go farther, we must be sure, I said. I cannot leave Tars Tarkas alive among the war hoons. Tonight I shall enter the city and make sure. And I shall go with you, spoke Carthoris. And I, said Zodar. Neither one of you shall go, I replied. It is work that requires stealth and strategy not force. One man alone may succeed where more would invite disaster. I shall go alone. If I need your help, I will return for you. They did not like it, but both were good soldiers, and it had been agreed that I should command. The sun already was low, so that I did not have long to wait before the sudden darkness of Barsoom engulfed us. With a parting word of instructions to Carthoris and Zodar, in case I should not return, I bade them all farewell, and set forth at a rapid dog-trot toward the city. As I emerged from the hills, the nearer moon was winging its wild flight through the heavens, its bright beams turning to burnished silver the barbaric splendor of the ancient metropolis. 
The city had been built upon the gently rolling foothills that in the dim and distant past had sloped down to meet the sea. It was due to this fact that I had no difficulty in entering the streets unobserved. The green hordes that use these deserted cities seldom occupy more than a few squares about the central plaza, and as they come and go always across the dead sea bottoms that the cities face. It is usually a matter of comparative ease to enter from the hillside. Once within the streets, I kept close in the dense shadows of the walls. At intersections, I halted a moment to make sure that none was in sight before I sprang quickly to the shadows of the opposite side. Thus, I made the journey to the vicinity of the plaza without detection. As I approached the purlieus of the inhabited portion of the city, I was made aware of the proximity of the warriors' quarters, by the squealing and grunting of the thoats and zitidars corralled within the hollow courtyards formed by the buildings surrounding each square. These old familiar sounds that are so distinctive of green Martian life sent a thrill of pleasure surging through me. It was as one might feel on coming home after a long absence. It was amid such sounds that I had first courted the incomparable Deja Thoris in the age-old marble halls of the dead city of Karad. As I stood in the shadows at the far corner of the first square which housed members of the horde, I saw warriors emerging from several of the buildings. They all went in the same direction, toward a great building which stood in the center of the plaza. My knowledge of green Martian customs convinced me that this was either the quarters of the principal chieftain or contained the audience chamber, wherein the Jeddak met his Jeds and lesser chieftains. In either event, it was evident that something was afoot which might have a bearing on the recent capture of Tars Tarkas. To reach this building, which I now felt it imperative that I do, I must needs traverse the entire length of one square and cross a broad avenue and a portion of the plaza. From the noises of the animals which came from every courtyard about me, I knew that there were many people in the surrounding buildings, probably several communities of the great horde of the Warhoons of the South. To pass undetected among all these people was in itself a difficult task, but if I was to find and rescue the great Thark, I must expect even more formidable obstacles before success could be mine. I had entered the city from the south, and now stood on the corner of the avenue through which I had passed, and the first intersecting avenue south of the plaza. The buildings upon the south side of this square did not appear to be inhabited, as I could see no lights, and so I decided to gain the inner courtyard through one of them. Nothing occurred to interrupt my progress through the deserted pile I chose, and I came into the inner court close to the rear walls of the east buildings without detection. Within the court, a great herd of thoats and zitidars moved restlessly about, cropping the moss-like ochre vegetation which overgrows practically the entire uncultivated area of Mars. What breeze there was came from the northwest, so there was little danger that the beasts would scent me. Had they, their squealing and grunting would have grown to such a volume as to attract the attention of the warriors within the buildings. Close to the east wall, Beneath the overhanging balconies of the second floors, I crept in dense shadows the full length of the courtyard until I came to the buildings at the north end. These were lighted for about three floors up, but above the third floor, all was dark. To pass through the lighted rooms was, of course, out of the question, since they swarmed with green Martian men and women. My only path lay through the upper floors, and to gain these it was necessary to scale the face of the wall. The reaching of the balcony of the second floor was a matter of easy accomplishment. An agile leap gave my hands a grasp upon the stone handrail above. In another instant, I had drawn myself up on the balcony. Here, through the open windows, I saw the green folk squatting upon their sleeping silks and furs, grunting an occasional monosyllable, which, in connection with their wondrous telepathic powers, is ample for their conversational requirements. As I drew closer to listen to their words, a warrior entered the room from the hall beyond. Come, Tangama, he cried. We are to take the Thark before Kab Kadja. Bring another with you. The warrior addressed arose, and beckoning to a fellow squatting near, the three turned and left the apartment. 
If I could but follow them, the chance might come to free Tars Tarkas at once. At least I would learn the location of his prison. At my right was a door leading from the balcony into the building. It was at the end of an unlighted hall, and on the impulse of the moment I stepped within. The hall was broad and led straight through to the front of the building. On either side were the doorways of the various apartments which lined it. I had no more than entered the corridor than I saw the three warriors at the other end, those whom I had just seen leaving the apartment. Then a turn to the right took them from my sight again. Quickly I hastened along the hallway in pursuit. My gait was reckless, but I felt that fate had been kind indeed to throw such an opportunity within my grasp, and I could not afford to allow it to elude me now. At the far end of the corridor I found a spiral stairway leading to the floors above and below. The three had evidently left the floor by this avenue. That they had gone down and not up I was sure from my knowledge of these ancient buildings and the methods of the war hoons. I myself had once been a prisoner of the cruel hordes of northern Warhoon, and the memory of the underground dungeon in which I lay still is vivid in my memory. And so I felt certain that Tars Tarkas lay in the dark pits beneath some nearby building, and that in that direction I should find the trail of the three warriors leading to his cell. Nor was I wrong. At the bottom of the runway, or rather at the landing on the floor below, I saw that the shaft descended into the pits beneath, and as I glanced down, the flickering light of a torch revealed the presence of the three I was trailing. Down they went toward the pits beneath the structure, and at a safe distance behind, I followed the flicker of their torch. The way led through a maze of tortuous corridors, unlighted save for the wavering light they carried. We had gone perhaps a hundred yards when the party turned abruptly through a doorway at their right. I hastened on as rapidly as I dared through the darkness until I reached the point at which they had left the corridor. There, through an open door, I saw them removing the chains that secured the great Thark, Tars Tarkas, to the wall. Hustling him roughly between them, they came immediately from the chamber, so quickly, in fact, that I was near to being apprehended. But I managed to run along the corridor in the direction I had been going in my pursuit of them far enough to be without the radius of their meagre light as they emerged from the cell. I had naturally assumed that they would return with Tars Tarkas the same way that they had come, which would have carried them away from me. But, to my chagrin, they wheeled directly in my direction as they left the room. There was nothing for me but to hasten on in advance and keep out of the light of their torch. I dared not attempt to halt in the darkness of any of the many intersecting corridors, for I knew nothing of the direction they might take. Chance was as likely as not to carry me into the very corridor they might choose to enter, the sensation of moving rapidly through these dark passages was far from reassuring. I knew not at what moment I might plunge headlong into some terrible pit, or meet with some of the ghoulish creatures that inhabit these lower worlds beneath the dead cities of dying Mars. There filtered to me a faint radiance from the torch of the men behind, just enough to permit me to trace the direction of the winding passageways directly before me, and so keep me from dashing myself against the walls at the turns. Presently, I came to a place where five corridors diverged from a common point. I had hastened along one of them for some little distance when suddenly the faint light of the torch disappeared from behind me. I paused to listen for sounds of the party behind me, but the silence was as utter as the silence of the tomb. Quickly, I realized that the warriors had taken one of the other corridors with their prisoner and so I hastened back with a feeling of considerable relief to take up a much safer and more desirable position behind them. It was much slower work returning, however, than it had been coming, for now the darkness was as utter as the silence. It was necessary to feel every foot of the way back with my hand against the side wall that I might not pass the spot where the five roads radiated. After what seemed an eternity to me, I reached the place and recognized it by groping across the entrances to the several corridors until I had counted five of them. In not one, however, showed the faintest sign of light. I listened intently, but the naked feet of the green men sent back no guiding echoes, though presently I thought I detected the clank of side arms in the far distance of the middle corridor. 
Up this, then, I hastened, searching for the light and stopping to listen occasionally for a repetition of the sound. But soon I was forced to admit that I must have been following a blind lead, as only darkness and silence rewarded my efforts. Again, I retraced my steps toward the parting of the ways, when to my surprise I came upon the entrance to three diverging corridors, any one of which I might have traversed in my hasty dash after the false clue I had been following. Here was a pretty fix indeed. Once back at the point where the five passageways met, I might wait with some assurance for the return of the warriors with Tars Tarkas. My knowledge of their customs lent colour to the belief that he was but being escorted to the audience chamber to have sentence passed upon him. I had not the slightest doubt but that they would preserve so doughty a warrior as the great Thark for the rare sport he would furnish at the great games. But unless I could find my way back to that point, the chances were most excellent that I would wander for days through the awful blackness until, overcome by thirst and hunger, I lay down to die. Or, what was that? A faint shuffling sounded behind me, and as I cast a hasty glance over my shoulder, my blood froze in my veins for the thing I saw there. It was not so much fear of the present danger as it was the horrifying memories it recalled of that time I near went mad over the corpse of the man I had killed in the dungeons of the war hoons, when blazing eyes came out of the dark recesses and dragged the thing that had been a man from my clutches, and I heard it scraping over the stone of my prison as they bore it away to their terrible feast. And now, in these black pits of the other war hoons, I looked into those same fiery eyes blazing at me through the terrible darkness, revealing no sign of the beast behind them. I think that the most fearsome attribute of these awesome creatures is their silence and the fact that one never sees them, nothing but those baleful eyes glaring unblinkingly out of the dark void behind. Grasping my longsword tightly in my hand, I backed slowly along the corridor away from the thing that watched me, but ever as I retreated, the eyes advanced, nor was there any sound, not even the sound of breathing, except the occasional shuffling sound as of the dragging of a dead limb that had first attracted my attention. On and on I went, but I could not escape my sinister pursuer. Suddenly I heard the shuffling noise at my right, and looking, saw another pair of eyes, evidently approaching from an intersecting corridor. As I started to renew my slow retreat, I heard the noise repeated behind me, and then before I could turn I heard it again at my left. The things were all about me. They had me surrounded at the intersection of two corridors. Retreat was cut off in all directions, unless I chose to charge one of the beasts. Even then I had no doubt, but that the others would hurl themselves upon my back. I could not even guess the size or nature of the weird creatures, that they were of goodly proportions I guessed from the fact that the eyes were on a level with my own. Why is it that darkness so magnifies our dangers? By day I would have charged the great banth itself, had I thought it necessary, but hemmed in by the darkness of these silent pits, I hesitated before a pair of eyes. Soon I saw that the matter shortly would be taken entirely from my hands, for the eyes at my right were moving slowly nearer me, as were those at my left, and those behind and before me. Gradually they were closing in upon me, but still that awful, stealthy silence. For what seemed hours, the eyes approached gradually closer and closer, until I felt that I should go mad for the horror of it. I had been constantly turning this way and that to prevent any sudden rush from behind until I was fairly worn out. At length, I could endure it no longer, and taking a fresh grasp upon my longsword, I turned suddenly and charged down upon one of my tormentors. As I was almost upon it, the thing retreated before me, but a sound from behind caused me to wheel in time to see three pairs of eyes rushing at me from the rear. With a cry of rage, I turned to meet the cowardly beasts, but as I advanced, they retreated as had their fellow. Another glance over my shoulder discovered the first eyes sneaking on me again, and again I charged, only to see the eyes retreat before me and hear the muffled rush of the three at my back. Thus we continued, the eyes always a little closer in the end than they had been before, 
until I thought that I should go mad with the terrible strain of the ordeal. That they were waiting to spring upon my back seemed evident, and that it would not be long before they succeeded was equally apparent, for I could not endure the wear of this repeated charge and countercharge indefinitely. In fact, I could feel myself weakening from the mental and physical strain I had been undergoing. At that moment, I caught another glimpse from the corner of my eye of the single pair of eyes at my back making a sudden rush upon me. I turned to meet the charge. There was a quick rush of the three from the other direction, but I determined to pursue the single pair until I should have at least settled my account with one of the beasts and thus be relieved of the strain of meeting attacks from both directions. There was no sound in the corridor, only that of my own breathing, yet I knew that those three uncanny creatures were almost upon me. The eyes in front were not retreating so rapidly now. I was almost within sword reach of them. I raised my sword arm to deal the blow that should free me, and then I felt a heavy body upon my back. A cold, moist, slimy something fastened itself upon my throat. I stumbled and went down. Chapter 15 Flight and Pursuit I could not have been unconscious more than a few seconds, and yet I know that I was unconscious, for the next thing I realized was that a growing radiance was illuminating the corridor about me, and the eyes were gone. I was unharmed except for a slight bruise upon my forehead where it had struck the stone flagging as I fell. I sprang to my feet to ascertain the cause of the light. It came from a torch in the hand of one of a party of four green warriors who were coming rapidly down the corridor toward me. They had not yet seen me, and so I lost no time in slipping into the first intersecting corridor that I could find. This time, however, I did not advance so far away from the main corridor as on the other occasion that had resulted in my losing Tars Tarkas and his guards. The party came rapidly toward the opening of the passageway in which I crouched against the wall. As they passed by, I breathed a sigh of relief. I had not been discovered, and best of all, the party was the same that I had followed into the pits. It consisted of Tars Tarkas and his three guards. I fell in behind them, and soon we were at the cell in which the great Thark had been chained. Two of the warriors remained without while the man with the keys entered with the Thark to fasten his irons upon him once more. The two outside started to stroll slowly in the direction of the spiral runway which led to the floors above, and in a moment were lost to view beyond a turn in the corridor. The torch had been stuck in a socket beside the door, so that its rays illuminated both the corridor and the cell at the same time. As I saw the two warriors disappear, I approached the entrance to the cell, with a well-defined plan already formulated. While I disliked the thought of carrying out the thing that I had decided upon, there seemed no alternative if Tars Tarkas and I were to go back together to my little camp in the hills. Keeping near the wall, I came quite close to the door to Tars Tarkas's cell, and there I stood with my longsword above my head, grasped with both hands that I might bring it down in one quick cut upon the skull of the jailer as he emerged. I disliked to dwell upon what followed after I heard the footsteps of the man as he approached the doorway. It is enough that within another minute or two, Tars Tarkas, wearing the metal of a Warhoon chief, was hurrying down the corridor toward the spiral runway, bearing the Warhoon's torch to light his way. A dozen paces behind him followed John Carter, Prince of Helium. The two companions of the man who lay now beside the door of the cell that had been Tars Tarkas's had just started to ascend the runway as the Thark came in view. Why so long, Tangama? cried one of the men. I had trouble with a lock, replied Tars Tarkas, and now I find that I have left my short sword in the Thark's cell. Go you on, I'll return and fetch it. As you will, Tangama, replied he who had before spoken. We shall see you above directly. Yes, replied Tars Tarkas, and turned as though to retrace his steps to the cell, but he only waited until the two had disappeared at the floor above. Then I joined him, we extinguished the torch, and together we crept toward the spiral incline that led to the upper floors of the building. 
At the first floor, we found that the hallway ran but halfway through, necessitating the crossing of a rear room full of green folk ere we could reach the inner courtyard. So there was but one thing left for us to do, and that was to gain the second floor and the hallway through which I had traversed the length of the building. Cautiously, we ascended. We could hear the sounds of conversation coming from the room above, but the hall still was unlighted, nor was anyone in sight as we gained the top of the runway. Together, we threaded the long hall and reached the balcony overlooking the courtyard without being detected. At our right was the window letting into the room in which I had seen Tangama and the other warriors as they started to Tars Tarkas's cell earlier in the evening. His companions had returned here, and we now overheard a portion of their conversation. What can be detaining Tangama? asked one. He certainly could not be all this time fetching his short sword from the Thark cell, spoke another. His short sword? asked a woman. What mean you? Tangama left his short sword in the Thark cell, explained the first speaker, and left us at the runway to return and get it. Tangama wore no short sword this night, said the woman. It was broken in today's battle with the Thark, and Tangama gave it to me to repair. See, I have it here. And as she spoke, she drew Tangama's short sword from beneath her sleeping silks and furs. The warriors sprang to their feet. There is something amiss here, cried one. Tis even what I myself thought when Tangama left us at the runway, said another. Methought then that his voice sounded strangely. Come, let us hasten to the pits. We waited to hear no more. Slinging my harness into a long single strap, I lowered Tars Tarkas to the courtyard beneath, and an instant later dropped to his side. We had spoken scarcely a dozen words since I had felled Tangama at the cell door and seen in the torch's light the expression of utter bewilderment upon the great Thark's face. By this time, he had said, I should have learned to wonder at nothing which John Carter accomplishes. That was all. He did not need to tell me that he appreciated the friendship which had prompted me to risk my life to rescue him, nor did he need to say that he was glad to see me. This fierce green warrior had been the first to greet me that day, now twenty years gone, which had witnessed my first advent upon Mars. He had met me with leveled spear and cruel hatred in his heart as he charged down upon me, bending low at the side of his mighty thoat as I stood beside the incubator of his horde upon the dead sea bottom beyond Korad. And now, among the inhabitants of two worlds, I counted none a better friend than Tars Tarkas, Jeddak of the Tharks. As we reached the courtyard, we stood in the shadows beneath the balcony for a moment to discuss our plans. There be five now in the party, Tars Tarkas, I said, Thuvia, Xodar, Carthoris, and ourselves. We shall need five thoats to bear us. Carthoris, he cried. Your son? Yes. I found him in the prison of Shador, on the Sea of Omean, in the land of the firstborn. I know not any of these places, John Carter, be they upon Barsoom. Upon and below, my friend, but wait until we shall have made good our escape and you shall hear the strangest narrative that ever a Barsoomian of the outer world gave ear to. Now we must steal our thoats and be well away to the north before these fellows discover how we have tricked them. In safety, we reached the great gates at the far end of the courtyard, through which it was necessary to take our thoats to the avenue beyond. It is no easy matter to handle five of these great fierce beasts, which by nature are as wild and ferocious as their masters, and held in subjection by cruelty and brute force alone. As we approached them, they sniffed our unfamiliar scent, and with squeals of rage circled about us. Their long, massive necks upreared raised their great, gaping mouths high above our heads. They are fearsome-appearing brutes at best, but when they are aroused, they are fully as dangerous as they look. The thoat stands a good ten feet at the shoulder. His hide is sleek and hairless, and of a dark, slate color on back and sides, shading down his eight legs to a vivid yellow at the huge, padded, nailless feet. The belly is pure white. 
A broad, flat tail, larger at the tip than at the root, completes the picture of this ferocious green Martian mount, a fit war steed for these warlike people. As the thoats are guided by telepathic means alone, there is no need for rein or bridle, and so our object now was to find two that would obey our unspoken commands. As they charged about us, we succeeded in mastering them sufficiently to prevent any concerted attack upon us, but the din of their squealing was certain to bring investigating warriors into the courtyard were it to continue much longer. At length, I was successful in reaching the side of one great brute, and ere he knew what I was about, I was firmly seated astride his glossy back. A moment later, Tars Tarkas had caught and mounted another, and then between us we herded three or four more toward the great gates. Tars Tarkas rode ahead and, leaning down to the latch, threw the barriers open, while I held the loose thoats from breaking back to the herd. Then together we rode through into the avenue with our stolen mounts, and without waiting to close the gates, hurried off toward the southern boundary of the city. Thus far our escape had been little short of marvellous, nor did our good fortune desert us, for we passed the outer purlieus of the dead city and came to our camp without hearing even the faintest sound of pursuit. Here a low whistle, the prearranged signal, apprised the balance of our party that I was returning, and we were met by the three with every manifestation of enthusiastic rejoicing. But little time was wasted in narration of our adventure. Tars, Tarkas, and Carthoris exchanged the dignified and formal greetings common upon Barsoom, but I could tell intuitively that the Thark loved my boy, and that Carthoris reciprocated his affection. Zodar and the Green Jeddak were formally presented to each other. Then Thuvia was lifted to the least fractious thoat. Zodar and Carthoris mounted two others, and we set out at a rapid pace toward the east. At the far extremity of the city, we circled toward the north, and under the glorious rays of the two moons, we sped noiselessly across the dead sea bottom, away from the war hoons and the firstborn, but to what new dangers and adventures we knew not. Toward noon of the following day, we halted to rest our mounts and ourselves. The beasts we hobbled, that they might move slowly about, cropping the ochre moss-like vegetation which constitutes both food and drink for them on the march. Thuvia volunteered to remain on watch while the balance of the party slept for an hour. It seemed to me that I had but closed my eyes when I felt her hand upon my shoulder and heard her soft voice warning me of a new danger. Arise, O oh Prince, she whispered. There be that behind us which has the appearance of a great body of pursuers. The girl stood pointing in the direction from whence we had come, and as I arose and looked, I too thought that I could detect a thin, dark line on the far horizon. I awoke the others. Tars Tarkas, whose giant stature towered high above the rest of us, could see the farthest. It is a great body of mounted men, he said, and they are travelling at high speed. There was no time to be lost. We sprang to our hobbled thoats, freed them, and mounted. Then we turned our faces once more toward the north and took our flight again at the highest speed of our slowest beast. For the balance of the day and all the following night, we raced across that ochre wilderness with the pursuers at our back ever gaining upon us. Slowly but surely, they were lessening the distance between us. Just before dark, they had been close enough for us to plainly distinguish that they were green Martians, and all during the long night, we distinctly heard the clanking of their accoutrements behind us. As the sun rose on the second day of our flight, it disclosed the pursuing horde not a half mile in our rear. As they saw us, a fiendish shout of triumph rose from their ranks. Several miles in advance lay a range of hills, the farther shore of the Dead Sea we had been crossing. Could we but reach these hills, our chances of escape would be greatly enhanced, but Thuvia's mount although carrying the lightest burden, already was showing signs of exhaustion. I was riding beside her when suddenly her animal staggered and lurched against mine. I saw that he was going down, but ere he fell, I snatched the girl from his back and swung her to a place upon my own throat, behind me, where she clung with her arms about me. 
This double burden soon proved too much for my already overtaxed beast, and thus our speed was terribly diminished, for the others would proceed no faster than the slowest of us could go. In that little party, there was not one who would desert another. Yet we were of different countries, different colors, different races, different religions, and one of us was of a different world. We were quite close to the hills, but the war hoons were gaining so rapidly that we had given up all hope of reaching them in time. Thuvia and I were in the rear, for our beast was lagging more and more. Suddenly, I felt the girl's warm lips press a kiss upon my shoulder. For thy sake, O oh my prince, she murmured. Then her arms slipped from about my waist and she was gone. I turned and saw that she had deliberately slipped to the ground in the very path of the cruel demons who pursued us, thinking that by lightening the burden of my mount, it might thus be enabled to bear me to the safety of the hills. Poor child, she should have known John Carter better than that. Turning my thoat, I urged him after her, hoping to reach her side and bear her on again in our hopeless flight. Carthoris must have glanced behind him at about the same time and taken in the situation, for by the time I had reached Thuvia's side, he was there also, and springing from his mount, he threw her upon its back, and turning the animal's head toward the hills, gave the beast a sharp crack across the rump with the flat of his sword. Then he attempted to do the same with mine. The brave boy's act of chivalrous self-sacrifice filled me with pride, nor did I care that it had wrested from us our last frail chance for escape. The war hoons were now close upon us. Tars Tarkas and Zodar had discovered our absence and were charging rapidly to our support. Everything pointed toward a splendid ending of my second journey to Barsoom. I hated to go out without having seen my divine princess and held her in my arms once again. But if it were not writ upon the book of fate that such was to be, then would I take the most that was coming to me. And in these last few moments that were to be vouchsafed me before I passed over into that unguessed future, I could at least give such an account of myself in my chosen vocation as would leave the war hoons of the South food for discourse for the next twenty generations. As Carthoris was not mounted, I slipped from the back of my own mount and took my place at his side to meet the charge of the howling devils bearing down upon us. A moment later, Tars Tarkas and Zodar ranged themselves on either hand, turning their thoats loose that we might all be on an equal footing. The war hoons were perhaps a hundred yards from us when a loud explosion sounded from above and behind us, and almost at the same instant a shell burst in their advancing ranks. At once, all was confusion. A hundred warriors toppled to the ground. Riderless thoats plunged hither and thither among the dead and dying. Dismounted warriors were trampled underfoot in the stampede which followed. All semblance of order had left the ranks of the green men and as they looked far above our heads to trace the origin of this unexpected attack, disorder turned to retreat and retreat to a wild panic. In another moment, they were racing as madly away from us as they had before been charging down upon us. We turned to look in the direction from whence the first report had come, and there we saw, just clearing the tops of the nearer hills, a great battleship swinging majestically through the air. Her bow gun spoke again even as we looked, and another shell burst among the fleeing war hoons. As she drew nearer, I could not repress a wild cry of elation, for upon her bows I saw the device of helium. Chapter 16 Under Arrest As Carthoris, Xodar, Tars Tarkas and I stood gazing at the magnificent vessel which meant so much to all of us, we saw a second and then a third top the summit of the hills and glide gracefully after their sister. Now a score of one-man air scouts were launching from the upper decks of the nearer vessel and in a moment more were speeding in long, swift dives to the ground about us. In another instant, we were surrounded by armed sailors and an officer had stepped forward to address us when his eyes fell upon Carthoris. With an exclamation of surprised pleasure, he sprang forward and placing his hands upon the boy's shoulder, called him by name. Carthoris, my prince, he cried. Kao, 
Kao! Horvastus greets the son of Deja Thoris, princess of Helium, and of her husband, John Carter. Where have you been, O oh my prince? All Helium has been plunged in sorrow. Terrible have been the calamities that have befallen your great-grandsire's mighty nation since the fatal day that saw you leave our midst. Grieve not, my good Horvastus, cried Carthoris, since I bring not back myself alone to cheer my mother's heart and the hearts of my beloved people, but also one whom all Barsoom loved best, her greatest warrior and her saviour, John Carter, Prince of Helium. Horvastus turned in the direction indicated by Carthoris, and as his eyes fell upon me, he was like to have collapsed from sheer surprise. John Carter, he exclaimed, and then a sudden troubled look came into his eyes. My prince, he started, where hast thou? And then he stopped, but I knew the question that his lips dared not frame. The loyal fellow would not be the one to force from mine a confession of the terrible truth that I had returned from the bosom of the ISs, the river of mystery, back from the shore of the lost sea of Chorus and the valley door. Ah, my prince, he continued, as though no thought had interrupted his greeting, that you are back is sufficient, and let Horvastus's sword have the high honour of being first at thy feet. With these words, the noble fellow unbuckled his scabbard and flung his sword upon the ground before me. Could you know the customs and the character of Red Martians, you would appreciate the depth of meaning that that simple act conveyed to me and to all about us who witnessed it. The thing was equivalent to saying, My sword, my body, my life, my soul are yours to do with as you wish. Until death and after death, I look to you alone for authority for my every act. Be you right or wrong, your word shall be my only truth. Whoso raises his hand against you must answer to my sword. It is the oath of fealty that men occasionally pay to a Jeddak whose high character and chivalrous acts have inspired the enthusiastic love of his followers. Never had I known this high tribute paid to a lesser mortal. There was but one response possible. I stooped and lifted the sword from the ground, raised the hilt to my lips, and then, stepping to Horvastus, I buckled the weapon upon him with my own hands. Horvastus, I said, placing my hand upon his shoulder, you know best the promptings of your own heart, that I shall need your sword, I have little doubt, but accept from John Carter upon his sacred honour the assurance that he will never call upon you to draw this sword other than in the cause of truth, justice, and righteousness. That I knew, my prince, he replied, ere ever I threw my beloved blade at thy feet. As we spoke, other flyers came and went between the ground and the battleship, and presently a larger boat was launched from above, one capable of carrying a dozen persons, perhaps, and dropped lightly near us. As she touched, an officer sprang from her deck to the ground, and advancing to Horvastus, saluted. Kantos Khan desires that this party whom we have rescued be brought immediately to the deck of the Xaverian, he said. As we approached the little craft, I looked about for the members of my party, and for the first time noticed that Thuvia was not among them. Questioning elicited the fact that none had seen her since Carthoris had sent her thoat galloping madly toward the hills in the hope of carrying her out of harm's way. Immediately, Horvastus dispatched a dozen air scouts in as many directions to search for her. It could not be possible that she had gone far since we had last seen her. We others stepped to the deck of the craft that had been sent to fetch us, and a moment later were upon the Xaverian. The first man to greet me was Kantos Khan himself. My old friend had won to the highest place in the navy of Helium but he was still to me the same brave comrade who had shared with me the privations of a Warhoon dungeon, the terrible atrocities of the great games, and later the dangers of our search for Deja Thoris within the hostile city of Zodanga. Then I had been an unknown wanderer upon a strange planet, and he a simple padwar in the navy of Helium. Today he commanded all Helium's great terrors of the skies, and I was a prince of the house of Tardos Mors, Jeddak of Helium. 
He did not ask me where I had been. Like Horvastus, he too dreaded the truth and would not be the one to wrest a statement from me. That it must come some time he well knew, but until it came, he seemed satisfied too, but know that I was with him once more. He greeted Carthoris and Tars Tarkas with the keenest delight, but he asked neither where he had been. He could scarcely keep his hands off the boy. You do not know, John Carter, he said to me, how we of Helium love this son of yours. It is as though all the great love we bore his noble father and his poor mother had been centered in him. When it became known that he was lost, ten million people wept. What mean you, Kantos Khan, I whispered, by his poor mother? For the words had seemed to carry a sinister meaning which I could not fathom. He drew me to one side. For a year, he said, ever since Carthoris disappeared, Dejah Thoris has grieved and mourned for her lost boy. The blow of years ago, when you did not return from the atmosphere plant, was lessened to some extent by the duties of motherhood, for your son broke his white shell that very night. That she suffered terribly then, all Helium knew, for did not all Helium suffer with her the loss of her lord? But with the boy gone, there was nothing left and after expedition upon expedition returned with the same hopeless tale of no clue as to his whereabouts, our beloved princess drooped lower and lower, until all who saw her felt that it could be but a matter of days ere she went to join her loved ones within the precincts of the valley door. As a last resort, Mors Kajak, her father, and Tardos Mors, her grandfather, took command of two mighty expeditions, and a month ago sailed away to explore every inch of ground in the northern hemisphere of Barsoom. For two weeks, no word has come back from them, but rumors were rife that they had met with a terrible disaster and that all were dead. About this time, Zat Aras renewed his importunities for her hand in marriage. He has been forever after her since you disappeared. She hated him and feared him, but with both her father and grandfather gone, Zat Aras was very powerful, for he is still Jed of Zodanga, to which position, you will remember, Tardos Mors appointed him after you had refused the honor. He had a secret audience with her six days ago. What took place none knows, but the next day Deja Thoris had disappeared, and with her had gone a dozen of her household guard and body servants, including Sola the Green Woman, Tars Tarkas' daughter, you recall. No word left they of their intentions, but it is always thus with those who go upon the voluntary pilgrimage from which none returns. We cannot think aught than that Dejah Thoris has sought the icy bosom of Iasis, and that her devoted servants have chosen to accompany her. Zat Aras was at Helium when she disappeared. He commands this fleet which has been searching for her since. No trace of her have we found, and I fear that it be a futile quest. While we talked, Horvastus's flyers were returning to the Xaverian. Not one, however, had discovered a trace of Thuvia. I was much depressed over the news of Dejah Thoris's disappearance, and now there was added the further burden of apprehension concerning the fate of this girl whom I believed to be the daughter of some proud Barsoomian house, and it had been my intention to make every effort to return her to her people. I was about to ask Kantos Khan to prosecute a further search for her when a flyer from the flagship of the fleet arrived at the Severian with an officer bearing a message to Kantos Khan from Aras. My friend read the dispatch and then turned to me. Zat Aras commands me to bring our prisoners before him. There is naught else to do. He is supreme in Helium, Yet it would be far more in keeping with chivalry and good taste were he to come hither and greet the saviour of Barsoom with the honours that are his due. You know full well, my friend, I said, smiling, that Zat Aras has good cause to hate me. Nothing would please him better than to humiliate me and then to kill me. Now that he has so excellent an excuse, let us go and see if he has the courage to take advantage of it. Summoning Carthoris, Tars Tarkas and Xodar, we entered the small flyer with Kantos Khan and Zat Aras' officer, and in a moment were stepping to the deck of Zat Aras's flagship. 
As we approached the Jed of Zodanga, no sign of greeting or recognition crossed his face. Not even to Carthoris did he vouchsafe a friendly word. His attitude was cold, haughty, and uncompromising. Kaor, Zat Aras, I said in greeting, but he did not respond. Why were these prisoners not disarmed? he asked Akantos Khan. They are not prisoners, Zat Aras, replied the officer. Two of them are of Helium's noblest family. Tars Tarkas, Jeddak of Thark, is Tardos Moor's best beloved ally. The other is a friend and companion of the Prince of Helium. That is enough for me to know. It is not enough for me, however, retorted Zat Aras. More must I hear from those who have taken the pilgrimage than their names. Where have you been, John Carter? I have just come from the Valley Door and the land of the firstborn Zat Aras, I replied. Ah! he exclaimed in evident pleasure. You do not deny it, then. You have returned from the bosom of Ises. I have come back from a land of false hope, from a valley of torture and death. With my companions, I have escaped from the hideous clutches of lying fiends. I have come back to the Barsoom that I saved from a painless death to again save her, but this time from death in its most frightful form. Cease, blasphemer, cried Zataras. Hope not to save thy cowardly carcass by inventing horrid lies to... But he got no further. One does not call John Carter coward and liar thus lightly, and Zat Aras should have known it. Before a hand could be raised to stop me, I was at his side, and one hand grasped his throat. Come I from heaven or hell, Zat Aras, you will find me still the same John Carter that I have always been, nor did ever man call me such names and live without apologizing. And with that, I commenced to bend him back across my knee and tighten my grip upon his throat. Seize him, cried Zat Aras, and a dozen officers sprang forward to assist him. Kantos Khan came close and whispered to me, Desist, I beg of you. It will but involve us all, for I cannot see these men lay hands upon you without aiding you. My officers and men will join me, and we shall have a mutiny then that may lead to the revolution. For the sake of Tardos Moors and Helium, desist. At his words, I released Zataras, and turning my back upon him, walked toward the ship's rail. Come, Kantos Khan, I said. The Prince of Helium would return to the Xaverian. None interfered. Zataras stood white and trembling amidst his officers. Some there were who looked upon him with scorn and drew toward me while one, a man long in the service and confidence of Tardos Moors, spoke to me in a low tone as I passed him. You may count my mettle among your fighting men, John Carter, he said. I thanked him and passed on. In silence we embarked, and shortly after stepped once more upon the deck of the Xaverian. Fifteen minutes later we received orders from the flagship to proceed toward Helium. Our journey thither was uneventful. Carthoris and I were wrapped in the gloomiest of thoughts. Kantos Khan was somber in contemplation of the further calamity that might fall upon Helium should Zataras attempt to follow the age-old precedent that allotted a terrible death to fugitives from the Valley Door. Tars Tarkas grieved for the loss of his daughter. Zodar alone was carefree, a fugitive and outlaw. He could be no worse off in Helium than elsewhere. Let us hope that we may at least go out with good red blood upon our blades, he said. It was a simple wish, and one most likely to be gratified. Among the officers of the Xaverian, I thought I could discern division into factions ere we had reached Helium. There were those who gathered about Carthoris and myself whenever the opportunity presented, while about an equal number held aloof from us. They offered us only the most courteous treatment, but were evidently bound by their superstitious belief in the doctrine of Dor and Ieses and Chorus. I could not blame them, for I knew how strong a hold a creed, however ridiculous it may be, may gain upon an otherwise intelligent people. By returning from Dor, we had committed a sacrilege. By recounting our adventures there, and stating the facts as they existed, we had outraged the religion of their fathers. We were blasphemers, lying, heretics. Even those who still clung to us from personal love and loyalty, I think did so in the face of the fact that at heart they questioned our veracity. 
It is very hard to accept a new religion for an old, no matter how alluring the promises of the new may be. But to reject the old as a tissue of falsehoods without being offered anything in its stead is indeed a most difficult thing to ask of any people. Kantos Khan would not talk of our experiences among the therns and the firstborn. It is enough, he said, that I jeopardize my life here and hereafter by countenancing you at all. Do not ask me to add still further to my sins by listening to what I have always been taught was the rankest heresy. I knew that sooner or later the time must come when our friends and enemies would be forced to declare themselves openly. When we reached Helium, there must be an accounting, and if Tardos Moors had not returned, I feared that the enmity of Zat Aras might weigh heavily against us, for he represented the government of Helium. To take sides against him were equivalent to treason. The majority of the troops would doubtless follow the lead of their officers, and I knew that many of the highest and most powerful men of both land and air forces would cleave to John Carter in the face of God, man, or devil. On the other hand, the majority of the populace unquestionably would demand that we pay the penalty of our sacrilege. The outlook seemed dark from whatever angle I viewed it, but my mind was so torn with anguish at the thought of Dejah Thoris that I realize now that I gave the terrible question of Helium's plight but scant attention at that time. There was always before me, day and night, a horrible nightmare of the frightful scenes through which I knew my princess might even then be passing. The horrid plant men, the ferocious white apes, at times I would cover my face with my hands in a vain effort to shut out the fearful thing from my mind. It was in the forenoon that we arrived above the mile-high Scarlet Tower, which marks Greater Helium from her twin city. As we descended in great circles toward the navy docks, a mighty multitude could be seen surging in the streets beneath. Helium had been notified by radio aerogram of our approach, from the deck of the Xaverian, we four, Carthoris, Tars Tarkas, Xodar, and I, were transferred to a lesser flyer to be transported to quarters within the Temple of Reward. It is here that Martian justice is meted to benefactor and malefactor. Here the hero is decorated. Here the felon is condemned. We were taken into the temple from the landing stage upon the roof so that we did not pass among the people at all, as is customary. Always before I had seen prisoners of note, or returned wanderers of eminence, paraded from the Gate of Jeddax to the Temple of Reward up the broad avenue of ancestors through dense crowds of jeering or cheering citizens. I knew that Zat Aras dared not trust the people near to us, for he feared that their love for Carthoris and myself might break into a demonstration which would wipe out their superstitious horror of the crime we were to be charged with. What his plans were I could only guess, but that they were sinister was evidenced by the fact that only his most trusted servitors accompanied us upon the flyer to the Temple of Reward. We were lodged in a room upon the south side of the temple, overlooking the Avenue of Ancestors, down which we could see the full length to the Gate of Jeddax, five miles away. The people in the Temple Plaza and in the streets for a distance of a full mile were standing as close-packed as it was possible for them to get. They were very orderly. There were neither scoffs nor plaudits, and when they saw us at the window above them, there were many who buried their faces in their arms and wept. Late in the afternoon, a messenger arrived from Zataras to inform us that we would be tried by an impartial body of nobles in the great hall of the temple at the first zode on the following day, or about 8.40 a.m. earth time. Wherever Captain Carter has used Martian measurements of time, distance, weight, and the like I have translated them into as nearly their equivalent in earthly values as is possible. His notes contain many Martian tables and a great volume of scientific data. But since the International Astronomic Society is at present engaged in classifying, investigating, and verifying this vast fund of remarkable and valuable information, I have felt that it will add nothing to the interest of Captain Carter's story or to the sum total of human knowledge to maintain a strict adherence to the original manuscript in these matters. 
while it might readily confuse the reader and detract from the interest of the history. For those who may be interested, however, I will explain that the Martian day is a trifle over 24 hours 37 minutes duration, Earth time. This the Martians divide into 10 equal parts, commencing the day at about 6 a.m. Earth time. The zodes are divided into 50 shorter periods, each of which in turn is composed of 200 brief periods of time, about equivalent to the earthly second. The Barsoomian table of time as here given is but a part of the full table appearing in Captain Carter's notes. Table 200 tails is equal to 1 zat 50 zats is equal to 1 zode. 10 zodes is equal to 1 revolution of Mars upon its axis. Chapter 17. The Death Sentence A few moments before the appointed time on the following morning, a strong guard of Zataris's officers appeared at our quarters to conduct us to the great hall of the temple. In twos we entered the chamber and marched down the broad Isle of Hope, as it is called, to the platform in the centre of the hall. Before and behind us marched armed guards, while three solid ranks of Zodengan soldiery lined either side of the aisle from the entrance to the rostrum. As we reached the raised enclosure, I saw our judges. As is the custom upon Barsoom, there were thirty-one, supposedly selected by lot from men of the noble class, for nobles were on trial. But to my amazement, I saw no single friendly face among them. Practically all were Zodangans, and it was I to whom Zodanga owed her defeat at the hands of the Green Hordes and her subsequent vassalage to Helium. There could be little justice here for John Carter or his son, or for the great Thark who had commanded the savage tribesmen who overran Zodanga's broad avenues, looting, burning, and murdering. About us the vast circular Colosseum was packed to its full capacity. All classes were represented, all ages, and both sexes. As we entered the hall, the hum of subdued conversation ceased until as we halted upon the platform, or throne of righteousness, the silence of death enveloped the ten thousand spectators. The judges were seated in a great circle about the periphery of the circular platform. We were assigned seats with our backs toward a small platform in the exact centre of the larger one. This placed us facing the judges and the audience. Upon the smaller platform each would take his place while his case was being heard. Zat Aras himself sat in the golden chair of the presiding magistrate. As we were seated and our guards retired to the foot of the stairway leading to the platform, he arose and called my name. John Carter, he cried. Take your place upon the pedestal of truth to be judged impartially according to your acts and here to know the reward you have earned thereby. Then, turning to and fro toward the audience, he narrated the acts upon the value of which my reward was to be determined. Know you, O judges and people of Helium, he said, that John Carter, one time Prince of Helium, has returned by his own statement from the valley door and even from the Temple of Issus itself. That, in the presence of many men of Helium, he has blasphemed against the sacred Ieses, and against the Valley Door, and the Lost Sea of Chorus, and the Holy Therns themselves, and even against Isis, goddess of death and of life eternal. And know you further by witness of thine own eyes, that see him here now upon the pedestal of truth, that he has indeed returned from these sacred precincts in the face of our ancient customs and in violation of the sanctity of our ancient religion. He who be once dead may not live again. He who attempts it must be made dead forever. Judges, your duty lies plain before you. Here can be no testimony in contravention of truth. What reward shall be meted to John Carter in accordance with the acts he has committed? Death, shouted one of the judges. And then a man sprang to his feet in the audience and raising his hand on high cried, Justice! 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 It was Kantos Khan, and as all eyes turned toward him, he leaped past the Zodangan soldiery and sprang upon the platform. What manner of justice be this? he cried to Zataras. The defendant has not been heard, nor has he had an opportunity to call others in his behalf. 
In the name of the people of Helium, I demand fair and impartial treatment for the Prince of Helium. A great cry arose from the audience then. Justice! 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 And Zat Aras dared not deny them. Speak then, he snarled, turning to me. But blaspheme not against the things that are sacred upon Barsoom. Men of Helium, I cried, turning to the spectators and speaking over the heads of my judges. How can John Carter expect justice from the men of Zodanga? He cannot, nor does he ask it. It is to the men of Helium that he states his case, nor does he appeal for mercy to any. It is not in his own cause that he speaks now, it is in thine, in the cause of your wives and daughters, and of wives and daughters yet unborn. It is to save them from the unthinkably atrocious indignities that I have seen heaped upon the fair women of Barsoom in the place men call the Temple of Issus. It is to save them from the sucking embrace of the plant men, from the fangs of the great white apes of Dor, from the cruel lust of the holy therns, from all that the cold dead I.S. carries them to from homes of love and life and happiness. Sits there no man here who does not know the history of John Carter, how he came among you from another world and rose from a prisoner among the green men through torture and persecution to a place high among the highest of Barsoom. Nor ever did you know John Carter to lie in his own behalf, or to say aught that might harm the people of Barsoom, or to speak lightly of the strange religion which he respected without understanding. There be no man here or elsewhere upon Barsoom today who does not owe his life directly to a single act of mine, in which I sacrifice myself and the happiness of my princess that you might live. And so, men of Helium, I think that I have the right to demand that I be heard, that I be believed, and that you let me serve you and save you from the false hereafter of Dor and Issus, as I saved you from the real death that other day. It is to you of Helium that I speak now. When I am done, let the men of Zodanga have their will with me. Zat Aras has taken my sword from me, so the men of Zodanga no longer fear me. Will you listen? Speak, John Carter, Prince of Helium, cried a great noble from the audience and the multitude echoed his permission until the building rocked with the noise of their demonstration. Zat Aras knew better than to interfere with such a sentiment as was expressed that day in the Temple of Reward, and so for two hours I talked with the people of Helium. But when I had finished, Zat Aras arose, and turning to the judges, said in a low tone, My nobles, you have heard John Carter's plea. Every opportunity has been given him to prove his innocence if he be not guilty, but instead he has but utilized the time in further blasphemy. What, gentlemen, is your verdict? Death to the blasphemer, cried one, springing to his feet, and in an instant the entire thirty-one judges were on their feet with upraised swords in token of the unanimity of their verdict. If the people did not hear Zat Aras's charge, they certainly did hear the verdict of the tribunal. A sullen murmur rose louder and louder about the packed Colosseum, and then Kantos Khan, who had not left the platform since first he had taken his place near me, raised his hand for silence. When he could be heard, he spoke to the people in a cool and level voice. You have heard the fate that the men of Zodanga would meet her to Helium's noblest hero. It may be the duty of the men of Helium to accept the verdict as final, let each man act according to his own heart. Here is the answer of Kantos Khan, head of the navy of Helium, to Zataras and his judges. And with that, he unbuckled his scabbard and threw his sword at my feet. In an instant, soldiers and citizens, officers and nobles were crowding past the soldiers of Zodanga and forcing their way to the throne of righteousness. A hundred men surged up on the platform, and a hundred blades rattled and clanked to the floor at my feet. Zataras and his officers were furious, but they were helpless. One by one, I raised the swords to my lips and buckled them again upon their owners. Come, said Kantos Khan, we will escort John Carter and his party to his own palace. And they formed about us and started toward the stairs leading to the Isle of Hope. Stop! 
cried Zat Aras. Soldiers of Helium, let no prisoner leave the throne of righteousness. The soldiery from Zodanga were the only organized body of heliometic troops within the temple, so Zat Aras was confident that his orders would be obeyed, but I do not think that he looked for the opposition that was raised the moment the soldiers advanced toward the throne. From every quarter of the Colosseum, swords flashed, and men rushed threateningly upon the Zodangans. Someone raised a cry. Tardos Mors is dead. A thousand years to John Carter, Jeddak of Helium. As I heard that, and saw the ugly attitude of the men of Helium toward the soldiers of Zataras, I knew that only a miracle could avert a clash that would end in civil war. Hold! I cried, leaping to the pedestal of truth once more. Let no man move till I am done. A single sword thrust here today may plunge Helium into a bitter and bloody war, the results of which none can foresee. It will turn brother against brother and father against son. No man's life is worth that sacrifice. Rather would I submit to the biased judgment of Zat Aras than be the cause of civil strife in Helium. Let us each give in a point to the other, and let this entire matter rest until Tardos Mors returns, or Mors Karjak his son. If neither be back at the end of a year, a second trial may be held. The thing has a precedent. And then turning to Zat Aras, I said in a low voice, Unless you be a bigger fool than I take you to be, you will grasp the chance I am offering you, ere it is too late. Once that multitude of swords below is drawn against your soldiery, no man upon Barsoom, not even Tardos Mors himself, can avert the consequences. What say you, Speak quickly. The Jed of Zodangan Helium raised his voice to the angry sea beneath us. Stay your hands, men of Helium, he shouted, his voice trembling with rage. The sentence of the court is passed, but the day of retribution has not been set. I, Zat Aras, Jed of Zodanga, appreciating the royal connections of the prisoner and his past services to Helium and Barsoom, grant a respite of one year or until the return of Mors Kajak, or Tardos Mors, to Helium. Disperse quietly to your houses. Go. No one moved. Instead, they stood in tense silence with their eyes fastened upon me as though waiting for a signal to attack. Clear the temple, commanded Zat Aras in a low tone to one of his officers. Fearing the result of an attempt to carry out this order by force, I stepped to the edge of the platform and, pointing toward the main entrance, bid them pass out. As one man, they turned at my request and filed, silent and threatening, past the soldiers of Zat Aras, Jed of Zodanga, who stood scowling in impotent rage. Kantos Khan, with the others who had sworn allegiance to me, still stood upon the throne of righteousness with me. Come, said Kantos Khan to me, we will escort you to your palace, my prince. Come, Carthoris and Xodar. Come, Tars Tarkas. And with a haughty sneer for Zat Aras upon his handsome lips, he turned and strode to the throne steps and up the Isle of Hope. We four and the hundred loyal ones followed behind him, nor was a hand raised to stay us, though glowering eyes followed our triumphal march through the temple. In the avenues we found a press of people, but they opened a pathway for us, and many were the swords that were flung at my feet as I passed through the city of Helium toward my palace upon the outskirts. Here my old slaves fell upon their knees and kissed my hands as I greeted them. They cared not where I had been. It was enough that I had returned to them. Ah, master, cried one, if our divine princess were but here, this would be a day indeed. Tears came to my eyes, so that I was forced to turn away that I might hide my emotions. Carthoris wept openly as the slaves pressed about him with expressions of affection and words of sorrow for our common loss. It was now that Tars Tarkas for the first time learned that his daughter, Sola, had accompanied Dejah Thoris upon the last long pilgrimage. I had not had the heart to tell him what Kantos Khan had told me. With the stoicism of the green Martian, he showed no sign of suffering, yet I knew that his grief was as poignant as my own. In marked contrast to his kind, he had in well-developed form the kindlier human characteristics of love, friendship, and charity. 
It was a sad and somber party that sat at the Feast of Welcome in the great dining hall of the Palace of the Prince of Helium that day. We were over a hundred strong, not counting the members of my little court, for Deja Thoris and I had maintained a household consistent with our royal rank. The board, according to Red Martian custom, was triangular, for there were three in our family. Carthoris and I presided in the centre of our sides of the table, midway of the third side, Deja Thoris's high-backed carven chair stood vacant except for her gorgeous wedding trappings and jewels which were draped upon it. Behind stood a slave as in the days when his mistress had occupied her place at the board, ready to do her bidding. It was the way upon Barsoom, so I endured the anguish of it though it wrung my heart to see that silent chair where should have been my laughing and vivacious princess, keeping the great hall ringing with her merry gaiety. At my right sat Kantos Khan, while to the right of Deja Thoris's empty place, Tars Tarkas sat in a huge chair before a raised section of the board, which years ago I had had constructed to meet the requirements of his mighty bulk. The place of honour at a Martian board is always at the hostess's right, and this place was ever reserved by Deja Thoris for the great Thark upon the occasions that he was in Helium. Horvastus sat in the seat of honour upon Carthoris's side of the table. There was little general conversation. It was a quiet and saddened party. The loss of Deja Thoris was still fresh in the minds of all, and to this was added fear for the safety of Tardos Mors and Mors Kajak, as well as doubt and uncertainty as to the fate of Helium, should it prove true that she was permanently deprived of her great Jeddak. Suddenly, our attention was attracted by the sound of distant shouting, as of many people raising their voices at once, but whether in anger or rejoicing, we could not tell. Nearer and nearer came the tumult. A slave rushed into the dining hall to cry that a great concourse of people was swarming through the palace gates. A second burst upon the heels of the first, alternately laughing and shrieking as a madman. Deja Thoris is found, he cried, a messenger from Deja Thoris. I waited to hear no more. The great windows of the dining hall overlooked the avenue leading to the main gates. They were upon the opposite side of the hall from me, with the table intervening. I did not waste time in circling the great board. With a single leap, I cleared table and diners and sprang upon the balcony beyond. Thirty feet below lay the scarlet sward of the lawn, and beyond were many people crowding about a great thoat which bore a rider headed toward the palace. I vaulted to the ground below and ran swiftly toward the advancing party. As I came near to them, I saw that the figure on the thoat was Sola. Where is the princess of Helium? I cried. The green girl slid from her mighty mount and ran toward me. Oh, my prince, my prince, she cried. She is gone forever. Even now she may be a captive upon the lesser moon. The black pirates of Barsoom have stolen her. Chapter 18 Sola's Story Once within the palace, I drew Sola to the dining hall and when she had greeted her father after the formal manner of the green men, she told the story of the pilgrimage and capture of Deja Thoris. Seven days ago, after her audience with Zat Aras, Deja Thoris attempted to slip from the palace in the dead of night. Although I had not heard the outcome of her interview with Zat Aras, I knew that something had occurred then to cause her the keenest mental agony, and when I discovered her creeping from the palace, I did not need to be told her destination. Hastily arousing a dozen of her most faithful guards, I explained my fears to them, and as one they enlisted with me to follow our beloved princess in her wanderings, even to the sacred ISs and the valley door. We came upon her but a short distance from the palace. With her was faithful Wooler of the Hound, but none other. When we overtook her, she feigned anger and ordered us back to the palace, but for once, we disobeyed her, and when she found that we would not let her go upon the last long pilgrimage alone, she wept and embraced us, and together we went out into the night toward the south. The following day we came upon a herd of small thoats, and thereafter we were mounted and made good time, 
We travelled very fast and very far due south, until the morning of the fifth day we sighted a great fleet of battleships sailing north. They saw us before we could seek shelter, and soon we were surrounded by a horde of black men. The princess's guard fought nobly to the end, but they were soon overcome and slain. Only Deja Thoris and I were spared. When she realized that she was in the clutches of the black pirates, she attempted to take her own life, but one of the blacks tore her dagger from her, and then they bound us both so that we could not use our hands. The fleet continued north after capturing us. There were about twenty large battleships in all, besides a number of small swift cruisers. That evening, one of the smaller cruisers that had been far in advance of the fleet returned with a prisoner, a young red woman whom they had picked up in a range of hills under the very noses, they said, of a fleet of three red Martian battleships. From scraps of conversation which we overheard, it was evident that the black pirates were searching for a party of fugitives that had escaped them several days prior. That they considered the capture of the young woman important was evident from the long and earnest interview the commander of the fleet held with her when she was brought to him. Later, she was bound and placed in the compartment with Deja Thoris and myself. The new captive was a very beautiful girl. She told Deja Thoris that many years ago she had taken the voluntary pilgrimage from the court of her father, the Jeddak of Patath. She was Thuvia, the princess of Patath. And then she asked Deja Thoris who she might be, and when she heard, she fell upon her knees and kissed Deja Thoris's fettered hands, and told her that that very morning she had been with John Carter, Prince of Helium, and Carthoris, her son. Deja Thoris could not believe her at first, but finally, when the girl had narrated all the strange adventures that had befallen her since she had met John Carter, and told her of the things John Carter and Carthoris and Zodar had narrated of their adventures in the land of the firstborn, Deja Thoris knew that it could be none other than the Prince of Helium. For who, she said, upon all Barsoom other than John Carter could have done the deeds you tell of? And when Thuvia told Deja Thoris of her love for John Carter, and his loyalty and devotion to the princess of his choice, Deja Thoris broke down and wept, cursing Zat Aras and the cruel fate that had driven her from Helium but a few brief days before the return of her beloved lord. I do not blame you for loving him, Thuvia, she said, and that your affection for him is pure and sincere, I can well believe from the candor of your avowal of it to me. The fleet continued north nearly to Helium, but last night they evidently realized that John Carter had indeed escaped them, and so they turned toward the south once more. Shortly thereafter, a guard entered our compartment and dragged me to the deck. There is no place in the land of the firstborn for a green one, he said, and with that he gave me a terrific shove that carried me toppling from the deck of the battleship. Evidently, this seemed to him the easiest way of ridding the vessel of my presence and killing me at the same time. But a kind fate intervened, and by a miracle I escaped with but slight bruises. The ship was moving slowly at the time, and as I lunged overboard into the darkness beneath, I shuddered at the awful plunge I thought awaited me, for all day the fleet had sailed thousands of feet above the ground. But to my utter surprise, I struck upon a soft mass of vegetation not twenty feet from the deck of the ship. In fact, the keel of the vessel must have been grazing the surface of the ground at the time. I lay all night where I had fallen, and the next morning brought an explanation of the fortunate coincidence that had saved me from a terrible death. As the sun rose, I saw a vast panorama of sea bottom and distant hills lying far below me. I was upon the highest peak of a lofty range. The fleet in the darkness of the preceding night had barely grazed the crest of the hills, and in the brief span that they hovered close to the surface, the black guard had pitched me, as he supposed, to my death. A few miles west of me was a great waterway. When I reached it, I found to my delight that it belonged to Helium. Here a thoat was procured for me, the rest you know. For many minutes, none spoke. Deja Thoris in the clutches of the firstborn. I shuddered at the thought, but of a sudden the old fire of unconquerable self-confidence surged through me. 
I sprang to my feet, and with back-thrown shoulders and upraised sword, took a solemn vow to reach, rescue, and revenge my princess. A hundred swords leaped from a hundred scabbards, and a hundred fighting men sprang to the tabletop and pledged me their lives and fortunes to the expedition. Already my plans were formulated. I thanked each loyal friend, and leaving Carthoris to entertain them, withdrew to my own audience chamber with Kantos Khan, Tars Tarkas, Xodar, and Horvastus. Here we discussed the details of our expedition until long after dark. Xodar was positive that Issus would choose both Dejah Thoris and Thuvia to serve her for a year. For that length of time, at least, they will be comparatively safe, he said, and we will at least know where to look for them. In the matter of equipping a fleet to enter a man, the details were left to Kantos Khan and Zodar. The former agreed to take such vessels as we required into dock as rapidly as possible, where Zodar would direct their equipment with water propellers. For many years the Black had been in charge of the refitting of captured battleships that they might navigate Oman, and so was familiar with the construction of the propellers, housings, and the auxiliary gearing required. It was estimated that it would require six months to complete our preparations in view of the fact that the utmost secrecy must be maintained to keep the project from the ears of Zat Aras. Kantos Khan was confident now that the man's ambitions were fully aroused and that nothing short of the title of Jeddak of Helium would satisfy him. I doubt, he said, if he would even welcome Dejah Thoris's return, for it would mean another nearer the throne than he. With you and Carthoris out of the way, there would be little to prevent him from assuming the title of Jeddak, and you may rest assured that so long as he is supreme here, there is no safety for either of you. There is a way, cried Horvastus, to thwart him effectually and forever. What? I asked. He smiled. I shall whisper it here, but some day I shall stand upon the dome of the Temple of Reward and shout it to cheering multitudes below. What do you mean? asked Kantos Khan. John Carter, Jeddak of Helium, said Horvastus in a low voice. The eyes of my companions lighted, and grim smiles of pleasure and anticipation overspread their faces as each eye turned toward me questioningly but I shook my head. No, my friends, I said, smiling. I thank you, but it cannot be. Not yet, at least. When we know that Tardos Moors and Moors Karjak are gone to return no more. If I be here, then I shall join you all to see that the people of Helium are permitted to choose fairly their next Jeddak. Whom they choose may count upon the loyalty of my sword, nor shall I seek the honor for myself. Until then... Tardos Moors is Jeddak of Helium, and Zat Aras is his representative. As you will, John Carter, said Horvastus. But what was that? he whispered, pointing toward the window overlooking the gardens. The words were scarce out of his mouth ere he had sprung to the balcony without. There he goes, he cried excitedly. The guards, below there, the guards! We were close behind him, and all saw the figure of a man run quickly across a little piece of sward and disappear in the shrubbery beyond. He was on the balcony when I first saw him, cried Horvastus. Quick, let us follow him. Together we ran to the gardens, but even though we scoured the grounds with the entire guard for hours, no trace could we find of the night marauder. What do you make of it, Kantos Khan? asked Tars Tarkas. A spy sent by Zat Aras, he replied. It was ever his way. He will have something interesting to report to his master then, laughed Horvastus. I hope he heard only our references to a new Jeddak, I said. If he overheard our plans to rescue Dejah Thoris, it will mean civil war, for he will attempt to thwart us, and in that I will not be thwarted. There would I turn against Tardos Moors himself were it necessary. If it throws all helium into a bloody conflict, I shall go on with these plans to save my princess. Nothing shall stay me now short of death, and should I die, my friends, will you take oath to prosecute the search for her and bring her back in safety to her grandfather's court? Upon the hilt of his sword, each of them swore to do as I had asked. 
It was agreed that the battleships that were to be remodeled should be ordered to Hasta, another heliometic city, far to the southwest. Kantos Khan thought that the docks there, in addition to their regular work, would accommodate at least six battleships at a time. As he was commander-in-chief of the navy, it would be a simple matter for him to order the vessels there as they could be handled, and thereafter keep the remodeled fleet in remote parts of the empire until we should be ready to assemble it for the dash upon Omean. It was late that night before our conference broke up, but each man there had his particular duties outlined, and the details of the entire plan had been mapped out. Kantos Khan and Zodar were to attend to the remodeling of the ships. Tars Tarkas was to get into communication with Thark, and learn the sentiments of his people toward his return from Dor. If favorable, he was to repair immediately to Thark, and devote his time to the assembling of a great horde of green warriors whom it was our plan to send in transports directly to the Valley Dor and the Temple of Issus while the fleet entered Omean and destroyed the vessels of the firstborn. Upon Horvastus devolved the delicate mission of organizing a secret force of fighting men sworn to follow John Carter wherever he might lead. As we estimated that it would require over a million men to man the thousand great battleships we intended to use on Omean and the transports for the green men, as well as the ships that were to convoy the transports, it was no trifling job that Horvastus had before him. After they had left, I bid Carthoris good night, for I was very tired, and going to my own apartments, bathed and lay down upon my sleeping silks and furs, for the first good night's sleep I had had an opportunity to look forward to since I had returned to Barsoom. But even now I was to be disappointed. How long I slept, I do not know. When I awoke suddenly, it was to find a half-dozen powerful men upon me, a gag already in my mouth, and a moment later, my arms and legs securely bound. So quickly had they worked, and to such good purpose, that I was utterly beyond the power to resist them by the time I was fully awake. Never a word spoke they, and the gag effectually prevented me speaking. Silently, they lifted me and bore me toward the door of my chamber. As they passed the window through which the Father Moon was casting its brilliant beams, I saw that each of the party had his face swathed in layers of silk. I couldn't recognize one of them. When they had come into the corridor with me, they turned toward a secret panel in the wall which led to the passage that terminated in the pits beneath the palace. That any knew of this panel outside my own household, I was doubtful. Yet the leader of the band did not hesitate a moment. He stepped directly to the panel, touched the concealed button, and as the door swung open, he stood aside while his companions entered with me. Then he closed the panel behind him and followed us. Down through the passageways to the pits we went. The leader rapped upon it with the hilt of his sword. Three quick, sharp blows, a pause, then three more, another pause, and then two. A second later, the wall swung in and I was pushed within a brilliantly lighted chamber in which sat three richly trapped men. One of them turned toward me with a sardonic smile upon his thin, cruel lips. It was Zat Aras. Chapter 19 Black Despair Ah, said Zat Aras, to what kindly circumstance am I indebted for the pleasure of this unexpected visit from the Prince of Helium? While he was speaking, one of my guards had removed the gag from my mouth, but I made no reply to Zat Aras, simply standing there in silence with level gaze fixed upon the Jed of Zodanga. And I doubt not that my expression was colored by the contempt I felt for the man. The eyes of those within the chamber were fixed first upon me, and then upon Zat Aras, until finally a flush of anger crept slowly over his face. You may go he said, to those who had brought me. And when only his two companions and ourselves were left in the chamber, he spoke to me again in a voice of ice, very slowly and deliberately, with many pauses, as though he would choose his words cautiously. John Carter, he said, by the edict of custom, by the law of our religion, and by the verdict of an impartial court, you are condemned to die. The people cannot save you. I alone may accomplish that. 
You are absolutely in my power to do with as I wish. I may kill you, or I may free you, and should I elect to kill you, none would be the wiser. Should you go free in Helium for a year, in accordance with the conditions of your reprieve, there is little fear that the people would ever insist upon the execution of the sentence imposed upon you. You may go free within two minutes, upon one condition. Tardos Mors will never return to Helium. Neither will Mors Kajak, nor Deja Thoris. Helium must select a new Jeddak within the year. Zat Aras would be Jeddak of Helium. Say that you will espouse my cause. This is the price of your freedom. I am done. I knew it was within the scope of Zat Aras's cruel heart to destroy me, and if I were dead, I could see little reason to doubt that he might easily become Jeddak of Helium. Free, I could prosecute the search for Deja Thoris. Were I dead, my brave comrades might not be able to carry out our plans. So, by refusing to accede to his request, it was quite probable that not only would I not prevent him from becoming Jeddak of Helium, but that I would be the means of sealing Deja Thoris's fate, of consigning her, through my refusal, to the horrors of the arena of Issus. For a moment I was perplexed, but for a moment only. The proud daughter of a thousand Jeddaks would choose death to a dishonorable alliance such as this. Nor could John Carter do less for Helium than his princess would do. Then I turned to Zat Aras. There can be no alliance, I said, between a traitor to Helium and a prince of the house of Tardos Mors. I do not believe, Zat Aras, that the great Jeddak is dead. Zat Aras shrugged his shoulders. It will not be long, John Carter, he said that your opinions will be of interest even to yourself, so make the best of them while you can. Zat Aras will permit you in due time to reflect further upon the magnanimous offer he has made you. Into the silence and darkness of the pits, you will enter upon your reflection this night, with the knowledge that should you fail within a reasonable time to agree to the alternative which has been offered you, never shall you emerge from the darkness and the silence again nor shall you know at what minute the hand will reach out through the darkness and the silence with the keen dagger that shall rob you of your last chance to win again the warmth and the freedom and joyousness of the outer world. Zataras clapped his hands as he ceased speaking. The guards returned. Zataras waved his hand in my direction. To the pits, he said. That was all. Four men accompanied me from the chamber, and with a radium handlight to illumine the way, escorted me through seemingly interminable tunnels, down, ever down beneath the city of Helium. At length, they halted within a fair-sized chamber. There were rings set in the rocky walls. To them, chains were fastened, and at the ends of many of the chains were human skeletons. One of these they kicked aside, and, unlocking the huge padlock that had held a chain about what had once been a human ankle, they snapped the iron band about my own leg. Then they left me, taking the light with them. Utter darkness prevailed. For a few minutes I could hear the clanking of accoutrements, but even this grew fainter and fainter, until at last the silence was as complete as the darkness. I was alone with my gruesome companions, with the bones of dead men whose fate was likely but the index of my own. How long I stood listening in the darkness I do not know, but the silence was unbroken, and at last I sunk to the hard floor of my prison, where, leaning my head against the stony wall, I slept. It must have been several hours later that I awakened to find a young man standing before me. In one hand he bore a light, in the other, a receptacle containing a gruel-like mixture, the common prison fare of Barsoom. Zat Aras sends you greetings, said the young man, and commands me to inform you that though he is fully advised of the plot to make you Jeddak of Helium, he is, however, not inclined to withdraw the offer which he has made you. To gain your freedom, you have but to request me to advise Zat Aras that you accept the terms of his proposition. I but shook my head. The youth said no more, and, after placing the food upon the floor at my side, returned up the corridor, taking the light with him. Twice a day for many days this youth came to my cell with food, and ever the same greetings from Zat Aras. 
For a long time I tried to engage him in conversation upon other matters, but he would not talk, and so, at length, I desisted. For months I sought to devise methods to inform Carthoris of my whereabouts. For months I scraped and scraped upon a single link of the massive chain which held me, hoping eventually to wear it through, that I might follow the youth back through the winding tunnels to a point where I could make a break for liberty. I was beside myself with anxiety for knowledge of the progress of the expedition which was to rescue Dejah Thoris. I felt that Carthoris would not let the matter drop, were he free to act, but in so far as I knew, he also might be a prisoner in Zat Aris's pits. That Zat Aris's spy had overheard our conversation relative to the selection of a new Jeddak I knew, and scarcely a half-dozen minutes prior, we had discussed the details of the plan to rescue Dejah Thoris. The chances were that that matter too was well known to him. Carthoris, Kantos Khan, Tars Tarkas, Horvastus and Xodar might even now be the victims of Zat Aris's assassins, or else his prisoners. I determined to make at least one more effort to learn something, and to this end I adopted strategy when next the youth came to my cell. I had noticed that he was a handsome fellow about the size and age of Carthoris, and I had also noticed that his shabby trappings but illy comported with his dignified and noble bearing. It was with these observations as a basis that I opened my negotiations with him upon his next subsequent visit. You have been very kind to me during my imprisonment here, I said to him, and as I feel that I have at best but a very short time to live, I wish, ere it is too late, to furnish substantial testimony of my appreciation of all that you have done to render my imprisonment bearable. Promptly, you have brought my food each day, seeing that it was pure and of sufficient quantity. Never by word or deed have you attempted to take advantage of my defenseless condition to insult or torture me. You have been uniformly courteous and considerate. It is this more than any other thing which prompts my feeling of gratitude and my desire to give you some slight token of it. In the guard room of my palace are many fine trappings. Go thou there and select the harness which most pleases you. It shall be yours. All I ask is that you wear it, that I may know that my wish has been realized. Tell me that you will do it. The boy's eyes had lighted with pleasure as I spoke, and I saw him glance from his rusty trappings to the magnificence of my own. For a moment he stood in thought before he spoke, and for that moment my heart fairly ceased beating. So much for me there was which hung upon the substance of his answer. And I went to the palace of the Prince of Helium with any such demand, they would laugh at me and, into the bargain, would more than likely throw me headforemost into the avenue. No, it cannot be, though I thank you for the offer. Why, if Zat Aras even dreamed that I contemplated such a thing, he would have my heart cut out of me. There can be no harm in it, my boy, I urged. By night you may go to my palace with a note from me to Carthoris, my son. You may read the note before you deliver it, that you may know that it contains nothing harmful to Zat Aras. My son will be discreet, and so none but us three need know. It is very simple, and such a harmless act that it could be condemned by no one. Again he stood silently in deep thought, and there is a jeweled short sword which I took from the body of a northern Jeddak. When you get the harness, see that Carthoris gives you that also. With it, and the harness which you may select, there will be no more handsomely accoutred warrior in all Zodanga. Bring writing materials when you come next to my cell, and within a few hours we shall see you garbed in a style befitting your birth and carriage. Still in thought, and without speaking, he turned and left me. I could not guess what his decision might be, and for hours I sat fretting over the outcome of the matter. If he accepted a message to Carthoris, it would mean to me that Carthoris still lived and was free. If the youth returned wearing the harness and the sword, I would know that Carthoris had received my note, and that he knew that I still lived. That the bearer of the note was a Zodangan would be sufficient to explain to Carthoris that I was a prisoner of Zat Aras. It was with feelings of excited expectancy, which I could scarce hide, that I heard the youth's approach upon the occasion of his next regular visit. 
I did not speak beyond my accustomed greeting of him. As he placed the food upon the floor by my side, he also deposited writing materials at the same time. My heart fairly bounded for joy. I had won my point. For a moment, I looked at the materials in feigned surprise, but soon I permitted an expression of dawning comprehension to come into my face, and then, picking them up, I penned a brief order to Carthoris to deliver to Parthak a harness of his selection and the short sword which I described. That was all, but it meant everything to me and to Carthoris. I laid the note open upon the floor. Parthak picked it up and, without a word, left me. As nearly as I could estimate, I had at this time been in the pits for three hundred days. If anything was to be done to save Dejah Thoris, it must be done quickly, for were she not already dead, her end must soon come, since those whom Issus chose lived but a single year. The next time I heard approaching footsteps, I could scarce await to see if Parthak wore the harness and the sword. But judge, if you can, my chagrin and disappointment when I saw that he who bore my food was not Parthak. What has become of Parthak? I asked, but the fellow would not answer, and as soon as he had deposited my food, turned and retraced his steps to the world above. Days came and went, and still my new jailer continued his duties, nor would he ever speak a word to me, either in reply to the simplest question or of his own initiative. I could only speculate on the cause of Parthak's removal, but that it was connected in some way directly with the note I had given him was most apparent to me. After all my rejoicing, I was no better off than before, for now I did not even know that Carthoris lived, for if Parthak had wished to raise himself in the estimation of Zataras, he would have permitted me to go on precisely as I did, so that he could carry my note to his master in proof of his own loyalty and devotion. Thirty days had passed since I had given the youth the note. Three hundred and thirty days had passed since my incarceration. As closely as I could figure, there remained a bare thirty days ere Dejah Thoris would be ordered to the arena for the rites of Issus. As the terrible picture forced itself vividly across my imagination, I buried my face in my arms and only with the greatest difficulty was it that I repressed the tears that welled to my eyes despite my every effort. To think of that beautiful creature torn and rended by the cruel fangs of the hideous white apes, it was unthinkable. Such a horrid fact could not be, and yet my reason told me that within thirty days my incomparable princess would be fought over in the arena of the firstborn by those very wild beasts, that her bleeding corpse would be dragged through the dirt and the dust, until at last a part of it would be rescued to be served as food upon the tables of the black nobles. I think that I should have gone crazy, but for the sound of my approaching jailer. It distracted my attention from the terrible thoughts that had been occupying my entire mind. Now a new and grim determination came to me. I would make one superhuman effort to escape, kill my jailer by a ruse, and trust a fate to lead me to the outer world in safety. With the thought came instant action. I threw myself upon the floor of my cell close by the wall in a strained and distorted posture as though I were dead after a struggle or convulsions. When he should stoop over me, I had but to grasp his throat with one hand and strike him a terrific blow with the slack of my chain, which I gripped firmly in my right hand for the purpose. Nearer and nearer came the doomed man. Now I heard him halt before me. There was a muttered exclamation, and then a step as he came to my side. I felt him kneel beside me. My grip tightened upon the chain. He leaned close to me. I must open my eyes to find his throat, grasp it, and strike one mighty final blow all at the same instant. The thing worked just as I had planned. So brief was the interval between the opening of my eyes and the fall of the chain that I could not check it, though in that minute interval I recognized the face so close to mine as that of my son, Carthoris. God, what cruel and malign fate had worked to such a frightful end! What devious chain of circumstances had led my boy to my side at this one particular minute of our lives when I could strike him down and kill him in ignorance of his identity? 
A benign though tardy providence blurred my vision and my mind as I sank into unconsciousness across the lifeless body of my only son. When I regained consciousness, it was to feel a cool, firm hand pressed upon my forehead. For an instant, I did not open my eyes. I was endeavouring to gather the loose ends of many thoughts and memories which flitted elusively through my tired and overwrought brain. At length came the cruel recollection of the thing that I had done in my last conscious act, and then I dared not to open my eyes for fear of what I should see lying beside me. I wondered who it could be who ministered to me. Carthoris must have had a companion whom I had not seen. Well, I must face the inevitable some time, so why not now? And with a sigh, I opened my eyes. Leaning over me was Carthoris, a great bruise upon his forehead where the chain had struck, but alive, thank God, alive. There was no one with him. Reaching out my arms, I took my boy within them, and if ever there arose from any planet a fervent prayer of gratitude, it was there beneath the crust of dying Mars as I thanked the eternal mystery for my son's life. The brief instant in which I had seen and recognized Carthoris before the chain fell must have been ample to check the force of the blow. He told me that he had lain unconscious for a time, how long he did not know. How came you here at all? I asked, mystified that he had found me without a guide. It was by your wit in apprising me of your existence and imprisonment through the youth, Parthak. Until he came for his harness and his sword, we had thought you dead. When I had read your note, I did as you had bid, giving Parthak his choice of the harnesses in the guardroom, and later bringing the jeweled short sword to him. But the minute that I had fulfilled the promise you evidently had made him, my obligation to him ceased. Then I commenced to question him, but he would give me no information as to your whereabouts. He was intensely loyal to Zat Aras. Finally, I gave him a fair choice between freedom and the pits beneath the palace, the price of freedom to be full information as to where you were imprisoned and directions which would lead us to you. But still, he maintained his stubborn partisanship. Despairing, I had him removed to the pits where he still is. No threats of torture or death, no bribes, however fabulous, would move him. His only reply to all our importunities was that whenever Parthak died, were it tomorrow or a thousand years hence, no man could truly say, a traitor is gone to his deserts. Finally, Zodar, who is a fiend for subtle craftiness, evolved a plan whereby we might worm the information from him and so I caused Horvastus to be harnessed in the metal of a Zodangan soldier and chained in Parthak's cell beside him. For fifteen days the noble Horvastus has languished in the darkness of the pits, but not in vain. Little by little he won the confidence and friendship of the Zodangan, until only today Parthak, thinking that he was speaking not only to a countryman, but to a dear friend, revealed to Horvastus the exact cell in which you lay. It took me but a short time to locate the plans of the pits of helium among the official papers. To come to you, though, was a trifle more difficult matter. As you know, while all the pits beneath the city are connected, there are but single entrances from those beneath each section and its neighbour, and that at the upper level, just underneath the ground. Of course, these openings which lead from contiguous pits to those beneath government buildings are always guarded, and so, while I easily came to the entrance to the pits beneath the palace which Zat Aras is occupying, I found there a Zodangan soldier on guard. There I left him when I had gone by, but his soul was no longer with him. And here I am, just in time to be nearly killed by you, he ended, laughing. As he talked, Carthoris had been working at the lock which held my fetters, and now, with an exclamation of pleasure, he dropped the end of the chain to the floor, and I stood up once more, freed from the galling irons I had chafed in for almost a year. He had brought a long sword and a dagger for me, and thus armed we set out upon the return journey to my palace. At the point where we left the pits of Zat Aras, we found the body of the guard Carthoris had slain. It had not yet been discovered, and, in order to still further delay search and mystify the Jed's people, we carried the body with us for a short distance 
hiding it in a tiny cell off the main corridor of the pits beneath an adjoining estate. Some half hour later, we came to the pits beneath our own palace, and soon thereafter emerged into the audience chamber itself, where we found Kantos Khan, Tars Tarkas, Horvastus, and Xoda awaiting us most impatiently. No time was lost in fruitless recounting of my imprisonment. What I desired to know was how well the plans we had laid nearly a year ago had been carried out. It has taken much longer than we had expected, replied Kantos Khan. The fact that we were compelled to maintain utter secrecy has handicapped us terribly. Zat Aras's spies are everywhere. Yet, to the best of my knowledge, no word of our real plans has reached the villain's ear. Tonight, there lies about the great docks at Hastor a fleet of a thousand of the mightiest battleships that ever sailed above Barsoom, and each equipped to navigate the air of Oman and the waters of Oman itself. Upon each battleship, there are five ten-man cruisers, and ten five-man scouts, and a hundred one-man scouts. In all, 116,000 craft fitted with both air and water propellers. At Thark lie the transports for the green warriors of Tars Tarkas, 900 large troop ships, and with them their convoys. Seven days ago, all was in readiness but we waited in the hope that by so doing your rescue might be encompassed in time for you to command the expedition. It is well we waited, my prince. How is it, Tars Tarkas, I asked, that the men of Thark take not the accustomed action against one who returns from the bosom of Iesses? They sent a council of fifty chieftains to talk with me here, replied the Thark. We are a just people, and when I told them the entire story, they were as one man in agreeing that their action toward me would be guided by the action of Helium toward John Carter. In the meantime, at their request, I was to resume my throne as Jeddak of Thark, that I might negotiate with neighboring hordes for warriors to compose the land forces of the expedition. I have done that which I agreed— 250,000 fighting men gathered from the ice cap at the north to the ice cap at the south, and representing a thousand different communities from a hundred wild and warlike hordes, fill the great city of Thark tonight. They are ready to sail for the land of the firstborn when I give the word and fight there until I bid them stop. All they ask is the loot they take and transportation to their own territories when the fighting and the looting are over. I am done. And thou, Horvastus, I asked, what has been thy success? A million veteran fighting men from Helium's thin waterways man the battleships, the transports, and the convoys, he replied. Each is sworn to loyalty and secrecy, nor were enough recruited from a single district to cause suspicion. Good, I cried. Each has done his duty, and now, Kantos Khan, May we not repair at once to Hasta and get under way before tomorrow's sun? We should lose no time, Prince, replied Kantos Khan. Already the people of Hastor are questioning the purpose of so great a fleet fully manned with fighting men. I wonder much that word of it has not before reached Zat Aras. A cruiser awaits above at your own dock. Let us leave at... A fusillade of shots from the palace gardens, just without cut short his further words... Together, we rushed to the balcony in time to see a dozen members of my palace guard disappear in the shadows of some distant shrubbery, as in pursuit of one who fled. Directly beneath us upon the scarlet sward, a handful of guardsmen were stooping above a still and prostrate form. While we watched, they lifted the figure in their arms, and at my command bore it to the audience chamber where we had been in council. When they stretched the body at our feet, we saw that it was that of a red man in the prime of life. His metal was plain, such as common soldiers wear, or those who wish to conceal their identity. Another of Zataras's spies, said Horvastus. So it would seem, I replied, and then to the guard, you may remove the body. Wait, said Zodar. If you will, prince, ask that a cloth and a little thoat oil be brought. I nodded to one of the soldiers, who left the chamber, returning presently with the things that Zodar had requested. The black kneeled beside the body, and dipping a corner of the cloth in the thoat oil, 
rubbed for a moment on the dead face before him. Then he turned to me with a smile, pointing to his work. I looked and saw that where Zodar had applied the thoat oil, the face was white, as white as mine, and then Zodar seized the black hair of the corpse and with a sudden wrench tore it all away, revealing a hairless pate beneath. Guardsmen and nobles pressed close about the silent witness upon the marble floor. Many were the exclamations of astonishment and questioning wonder as Zodar's acts confirmed the suspicion which he had held. Ah, Thern, whispered Tars Tarkas. Worse than that, I fear, replied Zodar. But let us see. With that, he drew his dagger and cut open a locked pouch which had dangled from the Thern's harness, and from it he brought forth a circlet of gold set with a large gem. It was the mate to that which I had taken from Seta Throg. He was a holy thern, said Zodar. Fortunate, indeed it is for us that he did not escape. The officer of the guard entered the chamber at this juncture. My prince, he said, I have to report that this fellow's companion escaped us. I think that it was with the connivance of one or more of the men at the gate, I have ordered them all under arrest. Zodar handed him the thoat oil and cloth. With this, you may discover the spy among you, he said. I at once ordered a secret search within the city, for every Martian noble maintains a secret service of his own. A half hour later, the officer of the guard came again to report. This time it was to confirm our worst fears. Half the guards at the gate that night had been therns disguised as red men. Come, I cried. We must lose no time. On to Hasta at once. Should the therns attempt to check us at the southern verge of the ice cap, it may result in the wrecking of all our plans and the total destruction of the expedition. Ten minutes later, we were speeding through the night toward Hasta, prepared to strike the first blow for the preservation of Deja Thoris. Chapter 20 The Air Battle Two hours after leaving my palace at Helium, or about midnight, Kantos Khan, Xodar, and I arrived at Hasta. Carthoris, Tars Tarkas, and Hor Vastus had gone directly to Thark upon another cruiser. The transports were to get under way immediately and move slowly south. The fleet of battleships would overtake them on the morning of the second day. At Hasta, we found all in readiness and so perfectly had Kantos Khan planned every detail of the campaign that within ten minutes of our arrival, the first of the fleet had soared aloft from its dock, and thereafter, at the rate of one a second, the great ships floated gracefully out into the night to form a long, thin line which stretched for miles toward the south. It was not until after we had entered the cabin of Kantos Khan that I thought to ask the date, for up to now I was not positive how long I had lain in the pits of Zat Aras. When Kantos Khan told me, I realized with a pang of dismay that I had misreckoned the time while I lay in the utter darkness of my cell. Three hundred and sixty-five days had passed, it was too late to save Deja Thoris. The expedition was no longer one of rescue, but of revenge. I did not remind Kantos Khan of the terrible fact that ere we could hope to enter the Temple of Issus, the Princess of Helium would be no more. In so far as I knew she might be already dead, for I did not know the exact date on which she first viewed Issus. What now the value of burdening my friends with my added personal sorrows? They had shared quite enough of them with me in the past. Hereafter, I would keep my grief to myself and so I said nothing to any other of the fact that we were too late. The expedition could yet do much if it could, but teach the people of Barsoom the facts of the cruel deception that had been worked upon them for countless ages, and thus save thousands each year from the horrid fate that awaited them at the conclusion of the voluntary pilgrimage. If it could open to the Red Men the fair valley door, it would have accomplished much, and in the land of lost souls between the mountains of Ots and the ice barrier were many broad acres that needed no irrigation to bear rich harvests. Here at the bottom of a dying world was the only naturally productive area upon its surface. Here alone were dews and rains, here alone was an open sea, here was water in plenty, 
and all this was but the stamping ground of fierce brutes, and from its beauteous and fertile expanse, the wicked remnants of two once mighty races barred all the other millions of Barsoom. Could I but succeed in once breaking down the barrier of religious superstition which had kept the red races from this El Dorado, it would be a fitting memorial to the immortal virtues of my princess. I should have again served Barsoom, and Deja Thoris's martyrdom would not have been in vain. On the morning of the second day, we raised the great fleet of transports and their consorts at the first flood of dawn, and soon were near enough to exchange signals. I may mention here that radio aerograms are seldom if ever used in wartime, or for the transmission of secret dispatches at any time, for as often as one nation discovers a new cipher, or invents a new instrument for wireless purposes, its neighbours bend every effort until they are able to intercept and translate the messages. For so long a time has this gone on that practically every possibility of wireless communication has been exhausted, and no nation dares transmit dispatches of importance in this way. Tars Tarkas reported all well with the transports. The battleships passed through to take an advanced position, and the combined fleets moved slowly over the ice cap, hugging the surface closely to prevent detection by the therns whose land we were approaching. Far in advance of all a thin line of one-man air scouts protected us from surprise, and on either side they flanked us, while a smaller number brought up the rear some twenty miles behind the transports. In this formation we had progressed toward the entrance to Omian for several hours when one of our scouts returned from the front to report that the cone-like summit of the entrance was in sight. At almost the same instant another scout from the left flank came racing toward the flagship. His very speed bespoke the importance of his information. Kantos Khan and I awaited him upon the little forward deck which corresponds with the bridge of earthly battleships. Scarcely had his tiny flyer come to rest upon the broad landing deck of the flagship ere he was bounding up the stairway to the deck where we stood. A great fleet of battleships south-southeast, my prince, he cried. There must be several thousands and they are bearing down directly upon us. The Thern spies were not in the palace of John Carter for nothing, said Kantos Khan to me. Your orders, prince. Dispatch ten battleships to guard the entrance to Omean with orders to let no hostile enter or leave the shaft. That will bottle up the great fleet of the firstborn. Form the balance of the battleships into a great V with the apex pointing directly south-southeast. Order the transports, surrounded by their convoys, to follow closely in the wake of the battleships until the point of the V has entered the enemy's line, then the V must open outward at the apex. The battleships of each leg engage the enemy fiercely and drive him back to form a lane through his line, into which the transports with their convoys must race at top speed that they may gain a position above the temples and gardens of the therns. Here let them land and teach the holy therns such a lesson in ferocious warfare as they will not forget for countless ages. It had not been my intention to be distracted from the main issue of the campaign, but we must settle this attack with the Therns once and for all, or there will be no peace for us while our fleet remains near door, and our chances of ever returning to the outer world will be greatly minimized. Kantos Khan saluted and turned to deliver my instructions to his waiting aides. In an incredibly short space of time, the formation of the battleships changed in accordance with my commands. The ten that were to guard the way to Omean were speeding toward their destination, and the troop ships and convoys were closing up in preparation for the spurt through the lane. The order of full speed ahead was given, the fleet sprang through the air like coursing greyhounds, and in another moment the ships of the enemy were in full view. They formed a ragged line as far as the eye could reach in either direction and about three ships deep. So sudden was our onslaught that they had no time to prepare for it. It was as unexpected as lightning from a clear sky. Every phase of my plan worked splendidly. Our huge ships mowed their way entirely through the line of Thern battlecraft. Then the V opened up, and a broad lane appeared through which the transports leaped toward the temples of the Therns, which could now be plainly seen glistening in the sunlight. 
by the time the therns had rallied from the attack, a hundred thousand green warriors were already pouring through their courts and gardens, while a hundred and fifty thousand others leaned from low swinging transports to direct their almost uncanny marksmanship upon the thern soldiery that manned the ramparts or attempted to defend the temples. Now, the two great fleets closed in a titanic struggle far above the fiendish din of battle in the gorgeous gardens of the Therns. Slowly, the two lines of Helium's battleships joined their ends, and then commenced the circling within the line of the enemy, which is so marked a characteristic of Barsoomian naval warfare. Around and around in each other's tracks moved the ships under Kantos Khan, until at length they formed nearly a perfect circle. By this time, they were moving at high speed, so that they presented a difficult target for the enemy. Broadside after broadside, they delivered as each vessel came in line with the ships of the therns. The latter attempted to rush in and break up the formation, but it was like stopping a buzzsaw with the bare hand. From my position on the deck beside Kantos Khan, I saw ship after ship of the enemy take the awful, sickening dive which proclaims its total destruction. Slowly, we maneuvered our circle of death until we hung above the gardens where our green warriors were engaged. The order was passed down for them to embark. Then they rose slowly to a position within the center of the circle. In the meantime, the Thern's fire had practically ceased. They had had enough of us and were only too glad to let us go on our way in peace. But our escape was not to be encompassed with such ease for scarcely had we gotten under way once more in the direction of the entrance to Omean than we saw far to the north a great black line topping the horizon. It could be nothing other than a fleet of war, whose or whither bound we could not even conjecture. When they had come close enough to make us out at all, Kantos Khan's operator received a radio aerogram, which he immediately handed to my companion. He read the thing and handed it to me. Kantos Khan, it read. Surrender in the name of the Jeddak of Helium, for you cannot escape, and it was signed, Zat Aras. The Therns must have caught and translated the message almost as soon as did we, for they immediately renewed hostilities when they realized that we were soon to be set upon by other enemies. Before Zat Aras had approached near enough to fire a shot, we were again hotly engaged with the Thern fleet, and as soon as he drew near, he too commenced to pour a terrific fusillade of heavy shot into us. Ship after ship reeled and staggered into uselessness beneath the pitiless fire that we were undergoing. The thing could not last much longer. I ordered the transports to descend again into the gardens of the therns. Wreak your vengeance to the utmost, was my message to the green allies, for by night there will be none left to avenge your wrongs. Presently, I saw the ten battleships that had been ordered to hold the shaft of Omean. They were returning at full speed, firing their stern batteries almost continuously. There could be but one explanation. They were being pursued by another hostile fleet. Well, the situation could be no worse. The expedition already was doomed. No man that had embarked upon it would return across that dreary ice cap. How I wished that I might face Zataras with my longsword for just an instant before I died. It was he who had caused our failure. As I watched the oncoming ten, I saw their pursuers race swiftly into sight. It was another great fleet. For a moment, I could not believe my eyes. But finally, I was forced to admit that the most fatal calamity had overtaken the expedition. For the fleet I saw was none other than the fleet of the firstborn that should have been safely bottled up in Omean. What a series of misfortunes and disasters! What awful fate hovered over me, that I should have been so terribly thwarted at every angle of my search for my lost love! Could it be possible that the curse of Issus was upon me, that there was indeed some malign divinity in that hideous carcass? I would not believe it and throwing back my shoulders, I ran to the deck below to join my men in repelling boarders from one of the thern craft that had grappled us broadside. In the wild lust of hand-to-hand -hand combat, my old, dauntless hopefulness returned, and as thern after thern went down beneath my blade, 
I could almost feel that we should win success in the end, even from apparent failure. My presence among the men so greatly inspirited them that they fell upon the luckless whites with such terrible ferocity that within a few moments we had turned the tables upon them, and a second later, as we swarmed their own decks, I had the satisfaction of seeing their commander take the long leap from the bows of his vessel in token of surrender and defeat. Then I joined Kantos Khan. He had been watching what had taken place on the deck below, and it seemed to have given him a new thought. Immediately he passed an order to one of his officers, and presently the colours of the Prince of Helium broke from every point of the flagship. A great cheer arose from the men of our own ship, a cheer that was taken up by every other vessel of our expedition, as they in turn broke my colours from their upper works. Then Kantos Khan sprang his coup, a signal legible to every sailor of all the fleets engaged in that fierce struggle was strung aloft upon the flagship. Men of Helium for the Prince of Helium against all his enemies, it read. Presently my colours broke from one of Zat Aris's ships, then from another and another. On some we could see fierce battles waging between the Zodangan soldiery and the Heliometic crews, but eventually the colours of the Prince of Helium floated above every ship that had followed Zat Aras upon our trail. Only his flagship flew them not. Zat Aras had brought five thousand ships. The sky was black with the three enormous fleets. It was Helium against the field now, and the fight had settled to countless individual duels. There could be little or no manoeuvring of fleets in that crowded, fire-split sky. Zat Aras's flagship was close to my own. I could see the thin features of the man from where I stood. His Zodangan crew was pouring broadside after broadside into us, and we were returning their fire with equal ferocity. Closer and closer came the two vessels, until but a few yards intervened. Grapplers and boarders lined the contiguous rails of each. We were preparing for the death struggle with our hated enemy. There was but a yard between the two mighty ships as the first grappling irons were hurled. I rushed to the deck to be with my men as they boarded. Just as the vessels came together with a slight shock, I forced my way through the lines and was the first to spring to the deck of Zataris's ship. After me poured a yelling, cheering, cursing throng of Helium's best fighting men. Nothing could withstand them in the fever of battle lust which enthralled them. Down went the Zodangans before that surging tide of war, and as my men cleared the lower decks, I sprang to the forward deck where stood Zat Aras. You are my prisoner, Zat Aras, I cried. Yield, and you shall have quarter. For a moment, I could not tell whether he contemplated acceding to my demand or facing me with drawn sword. For an instant, he stood hesitating, and then throwing down his arms, he turned and rushed to the opposite side of the deck. Before I could overtake him, he had sprung to the rail and hurled himself head foremost into the awful depths below. And thus came Zat Aras, Jed of Zodanga, to his end. On and on went that strange battle. The Therns and Blacks had not combined against us. Wherever Thern ship met ship of the firstborn was a battle royal, and in this I thought I saw our salvation. Wherever messages could be passed between us that could not be intercepted by our enemies, I passed the word that all our vessels were to withdraw from the fight as rapidly as possible, taking a position to the west and south of the combatants. I also sent an air scout to the fighting green men in the gardens below to re-embark and to the transports to join us. My commanders were further instructed that when engaged with an enemy to draw him as rapidly as possible toward a ship of his hereditary foemen, and by careful manoeuvring to force the two to engage, thus leaving himself free to withdraw. This stratagem worked to perfection, and just before the sun went down, I had the satisfaction of seeing all that was left of my once mighty fleet gathered nearly twenty miles southwest of the still terrific battle between the blacks and whites. I now transferred Ixodar to another battleship and sent him with all the transports and five thousand battleships directly overhead to the Temple of Issus. Carthoris and I, with Kantos Khan, took the remaining ships and headed for the entrance to Omean. 
Our plan now was to attempt to make a combined assault upon Issus at dawn of the following day. Tars Tarkas with his green warriors and Horvastus with the red men, guided by Zodar, were to land within the garden of Issus or the surrounding plains, while Carthoris, Kantos Khan and I were to lead our smaller force from the Sea of Omean through the pits beneath the temple, which Carthoris knew so well. I now learned for the first time the cause of my ten ships' retreat from the mouth of the shaft. It seemed that when they had come upon the shaft, the navy of the firstborn were already issuing from its mouth. Fully twenty vessels had emerged, and though they gave battle immediately in an effort to stem the tide that rolled from the black pit, the odds against them were too great, and they were forced to flee. With great caution, we approached the shaft, under cover of darkness. At a distance of several miles, I caused the fleet to be halted, and from there Carthoris went ahead alone upon a one-man flyer to reconnoitre. In perhaps half an hour, he returned to report that there was no sign of a patrol boat or of the enemy in any form, and so we moved swiftly and noiselessly forward once more toward Omian. At the mouth of the shaft, we stopped again for a moment, for all the vessels to reach their previously appointed stations, then with the flagship, I dropped quickly into the black depths, while one by one the other vessels followed me in quick succession. We had decided to stake all on the chance that we would be able to reach the temple by the subterranean way, and so we left no guard of vessels at the shaft's mouth. Nor would it have profited us any to have done so, for we did not have sufficient force all told to have withstood the vast navy of the firstborn had they returned to engage us. For the safety of our entrance upon Oman, we depended largely upon the very boldness of it. Believing that it would be some little time before the firstborn on guard, they would realize that it was an enemy and not their own returning fleet that was entering the vault of the buried sea. And such proved to be the case. In fact, four hundred of my fleet of five hundred rested safely upon the bosom of a man before the first shot was fired. The battle was short and hot, but there could have been but one outcome. For the firstborn in the carelessness of fancied security had left but a handful of ancient and obsolete hulks to guard their mighty harbour. It was at Carthoris's suggestion that we landed our prisoners under guard upon a couple of the larger islands, and then towed the ships of the firstborn to the shaft, where we managed to wedge a number of them securely in the interior of the great well. Then we turned on the buoyance rays in the balance of them, and let them rise by themselves to further block the passage to Oman as they came into contact with the vessels already lodged there. We now felt that it would be some time at least before the returning firstborn could reach the surface of Oman, and that we would have ample opportunity to make for the subterranean passages which lead to Issus. One of the first steps I took was to hasten personally with a good-sized force to the island of the submarine, which I took without resistance on the part of the small guard there. I found the submarine in its pool, and at once placed a strong guard upon it and the island, where I remained to wait the coming of Carthoris and the others. Among the prisoners was Yersted, commander of the submarine. He recognized me from the three trips that I had taken with him during my captivity among the firstborn. How does it seem, I asked him, to have the tables turned, to be prisoner of your erstwhile captive? He smiled, a very grim smile, pregnant with hidden meaning. It will not be for long, John Carter, he replied. We have been expecting you, and we are prepared. So it would appear, I answered for you were all ready to become my prisoners with scarce a blow struck on either side. The fleet must have missed you, he said, but it will return to Omean, and then that will be a very different matter for John Carter. I do not know that the fleet has missed me as yet, I said, but of course he did not grasp my meaning and only looked puzzled. Many prisoners travel to Issus in your grim craft, Yersted, I asked. Very many, he assented. Might you remember one whom men called Deja Thoris? Well, indeed, for her great beauty, and then, too, for the fact that she was wife to the first mortal that ever escaped from Issus through all the countless ages of her godhood. 
and the way that Issus remembers her best as the wife of one and the mother of another who raised their hands against the goddess of life eternal. I shuddered for fear of the cowardly revenge that I knew Issus might have taken upon the innocent Deja Thoris for the sacrilege of her son and her husband. And where is Deja Thoris now? I asked, knowing that he would say the words I most dreaded, but yet I loved her so that I could not refrain from hearing even the worst about her fate, so that it fell from the lips of one who had seen her, but recently. It was to me as though it brought her closer to me. Yesterday, the monthly rites of Issus were held, replied Yested, and I saw her then, sitting in her accustomed place at the foot of Issus. What? I cried. She is not dead, then. Why, no, replied the black. It has been no year since she gazed upon the divine glory of the radiant face of... No year, I interrupted. Why, no, insisted Yersted. It cannot have been upward of three hundred and seventy or eighty days. A great light burst upon me. How stupid I had been. I could scarcely retain an outward exhibition of my great joy. Why had I forgotten the great difference in the length of Martian and earthly years? The ten earth years I had spent upon Barsoom had encompassed but five years and ninety-six days of Martian time, whose days are forty-one minutes longer than ours, and whose years number six hundred and eighty-seven days. I am in time. I am in time. The words surged through my brain again and again, until at last I must have voiced them audibly, for Yersted shook his head. In time to save your princess, he asked, and then without waiting for my reply, No, John Carter, Issus will not give up her own. She knows that you are coming, and ere ever a vandal foot is set within the precincts of the Temple of Issus, if such a calamity should befall, Deja Thoris will be put away forever from the last faint hope of rescue. You mean that she will be killed merely to thwart me? I asked. Not that other than as a last resort, he replied. Hast ever heard of the Temple of the Sun? It is there that they will put her. It lies far within the inner court of the Temple of Issus, a little temple that raises a thin spire far above the spires and minarets of the great temple that surrounds it. Beneath it, in the ground, there lies the main body of the temple consisting in 687 circular chambers, one below another. To each chamber, a single corridor leads through solid rock from the pits of Issus. As the entire Temple of the Sun revolves once with each revolution of Barsoom about the sun, but once each year does the entrance to each separate chamber come opposite the mouth of the corridor, which forms its only link to the world without. Here, Issus puts those who displease her, but whom she does not care to execute forthwith, or to punish a noble of the firstborn, she may cause him to be placed within a chamber of the Temple of the Sun for a year. Oft times she imprisons an executioner with the condemned, that death may come in a certain horrible form upon a given day, or again, but enough food is deposited in the chamber to sustain life, but the number of days that Issus has allotted for mental anguish. Thus will Deja Thoris die and her fate will be sealed by the first alien foot that crosses the threshold of Issus. So I was to be thwarted in the end, although I had performed the miraculous, and come within a few short moments of my divine princess, yet was I as far from her as when I stood upon the banks of the Hudson forty-eight million miles away. Chapter 21 Through Flood and Flame Yersted's information convinced me that there was no time to be lost. I must reach the Temple of Issu secretly before the forces under Tars Tarkas assaulted at dawn. Once within its hated walls, I was positive that I could overcome the guards of Issus and bear away my princess, for at my back I would have a force ample for the occasion. No sooner had Carthoris and the others joined me than we commenced the transportation of our men through the submerged passage to the mouth of the gangways, which lead from the submarine pool at the temple end of the watery tunnel to the pits of Issus. Many trips were required, but at last all stood safely together again at the beginning of the end of our quest, 
Five thousand strong we were, all seasoned fighting men of the most warlike race of the Red Men of Barsoom. As Carthoris alone knew the hidden ways of the tunnels, we could not divide the party and attack the temple at several points at once, as would have been most desirable, and so it was decided that he lead us all as quickly as possible to a point near the temple center. As we were about to leave the pool and enter the corridor, an officer called my attention to the waters upon which the submarine floated. At first they seemed to be merely agitated, as from the movement of some great body beneath the surface, and I at once conjectured that another submarine was rising to the surface in pursuit of us. But presently it became apparent that the level of the waters was rising, not with extreme rapidity, but very surely and that soon they would overflow the sides of the pool and submerge the floor of the chamber. For a moment I did not fully grasp the terrible import of the slowly rising water. It was Carthoris who realized the full meaning of the thing, its cause and the reason for it. Haste, he cried. If we delay, we all are lost. The pumps of Omeyan have been stopped. They would drown us like rats in a trap. We must reach the upper levels of the pits in advance of the flood, or we shall never reach them. Come. Lead the way, Carthoris, I cried. We will follow. At my command, the youth leaped into one of the corridors, and in column of twos, the soldiers followed him in good order, each company entering the corridor only at the command of its dwar or captain. Before the last company filed from the chamber, the water was ankle deep, and that the men were nervous was quite evident. Entirely unaccustomed to water, except in quantities sufficient for drinking and bathing purposes, the Red Martians instinctively shrank from it in such formidable depths and menacing activity. That they were undaunted while it swirled and eddied about their ankles spoke well for their bravery and their discipline. I was the last to leave the chamber of the submarine, and as I followed the rear of the column toward the corridor, I moved through water to my knees. The corridor, too, was flooded to the same depth, for its floor was on a level with the floor of the chamber from which it led, nor was there any perceptible rise for many yards. The march of the troops through the corridor was as rapid as was consistent with the number of men that moved through so narrow a passage, but it was not ample to permit us to gain appreciably on the pursuing tide. As the level of the passage rose, so too did the waters rise until it soon became apparent to me who brought up the rear that they were gaining rapidly upon us. I could understand the reason for this, as with the narrowing expanse of Omean as the waters rose toward the apex of its dome, the rapidity of its rise would increase in inverse ratio to the ever-lessening space to be filled. Long ere the last of the column could hope to reach the upper pits, which lay above the danger point I was convinced that the waters would surge after us in overwhelming volume, and that fully half the expedition would be snuffed out. As I cast about for some means of saving as many as possible of the doomed men, I saw a diverging corridor which seemed to rise at a steep angle at my right. The waters were now swirling about my waist. The men directly before me were quickly becoming panic-stricken. Something must be done at once, or they would rush forward upon their fellows in a mad stampede that would result in trampling down hundreds beneath the flood and eventually clogging the passage beyond any hope of retreat for those in advance. Raising my voice to its utmost, I shouted my command to the dwarves ahead of me. Call back the last twenty-five Utans, I shouted. Here seems a way of escape. Turn back and follow me. My orders were obeyed by nearer thirty Utans, so that some three thousand men came about and hastened into the teeth of the flood to reach the corridor up which I directed them. As the first dwarf passed in with his Utan, I cautioned him to listen closely for my commands and under no circumstances to venture into the open or leave the pits for the temple proper until I should have come up with him. Or you know that I died before I could reach you. The officer saluted and left me. The men filed rapidly past me and entered the diverging corridor which I hoped would lead to safety. The water rose breast high. Men stumbled, floundered, and went down. Many I grasped and set upon their feet again, 
but alone the work was greater than I could cope with. Soldiers were being swept beneath the boiling torrent, never to rise. At length, the dwarf of the Tenth Utan took a stand beside me. He was a valorous soldier, Gertus by name, and together we kept the now thoroughly frightened troops in the semblance of order and rescued many that would have drowned otherwise. Jor Kantos, son of Kantos Khan, and a padwar of the Fifth Utan, joined us when his Utan reached the opening through which the men were fleeing. Thereafter, not a man was lost of all the hundreds that remained to pass from the main corridor to the branch. As the last Utan was filing past us, the waters had risen until they surged about our necks, but we clasped hands and stood our ground until the last man had passed to the comparative safety of the new passageway. Here, we found an immediate and steep ascent, so that within a hundred yards we had reached a point above the waters. For a few minutes, we continued rapidly up the steep grade, which I hoped would soon bring us quickly to the upper pits that let into the Temple of Issus. But I was to meet with a cruel disappointment. Suddenly, I heard a cry of fire far ahead, followed almost at once by cries of terror and the loud commands of dwarves and padwars who were evidently attempting to direct their men away from some grave danger. At last, the report came back to us. They have fired the pits ahead. We are hemmed in by flames in front and flood behind. Help, John Carter. We are suffocating. And then they're swept back upon us at the rear, a wave of dense smoke that sent us, stumbling and blinded, into a choking retreat. There was naught to do other than seek a new avenue of escape. The fire and smoke were to be feared a thousand times over the water, and so I seized upon the first gallery which led out of and up from the suffocating smoke that was engulfing us. Again, I stood to one side while the soldiers hastened through on the new way. Some two thousand must have passed at a rapid run when the stream ceased, but I was not sure that all had been rescued who had not passed the point of origin of the flames, and so to assure myself that no poor devil was left behind to die a horrible death. Unsuckered, I ran quickly up the gallery in the direction of the flames, which I could now see burning with a dull glow far ahead. It was hot and stifling work, but at last I reached a point where the fire lit up the corridor sufficiently for me to see that no soldier of helium lay between me and the conflagration. What was in it, or upon the far side, I could not know, nor could any man have passed through that seething hell of chemicals and lived to learn. Having satisfied my sense of duty, I turned and ran rapidly back to the corridor through which my men had passed. To my horror, however, I found that my retreat in this direction had been blocked. Across the mouth of the corridor stood a massive steel grating that had evidently been lowered from its resting place above for the purpose of effectually cutting off my escape. That our principal movements were known to the firstborn, I could not have doubted in view of the attack of the fleet upon us the day before, nor could the stopping of the pumps of Oman at the psychological moment have been due to chance, nor the starting of a chemical combustion within the one corridor through which we were advancing upon the Temple of Issus been due to aught than well-calculated design. And now the dropping of the steel gate to pen me effectually between fire and flood seemed to indicate that invisible eyes were upon us at every moment. What chance had I then to rescue Dejah Thoris? Were I to be compelled to fight foes who never showed themselves? A thousand times I berated myself for being drawn into such a trap as I might have known these pits easily could be. Now I saw that it would have been much better to have kept our force intact and made a concerted attack upon the temple from the valley side, trusting to chance and our great fighting ability to have overwhelmed the firstborn and compelled the safe delivery of Dejah Thoris to me. The smoke from the fire was forcing me further and further back down the corridor toward the waters which I could hear surging through the darkness. With my men had gone the last torch, nor was this corridor lighted by the radiance of phosphorescent rock as were those of the lower levels. It was this fact that assured me that I was not far from the upper pits which lie directly beneath the temple. Finally, I felt the lapping waters about my feet, the smoke 
was thick behind me. My suffering was intense. There seemed but one thing to do, and that to choose the easier death which confronted me, and so I moved on down the corridor until the cold waters of Omean closed about me, and I swam on through utter blackness toward what? The instinct of self-preservation is strong, even when one, unafraid and in the possession of his highest reasoning faculties, knows that death, positive and unalterable, lies just ahead. And so I swam slowly on, waiting for my head to touch the top of the corridor, which would mean that I had reached the limit of my flight, and the point where I must sink forever to an unmarked grave. But to my surprise, I ran against a blank wall before I reached a point where the waters came to the roof of the corridor. Could I be mistaken? I felt around. No, I had come to the main corridor, and still there was a breathing space between the surface of the water and the rocky ceiling above. And then I turned up the main corridor in the direction that Carthoris and the head of the column had passed a half hour before. On and on I swam, my heart growing lighter at every stroke, for I knew that I was approaching closer and closer to the point where there would be no chance that the waters ahead could be deeper than they were about me. I was positive that I must soon feel the solid floor beneath my feet again, and that once more my chance would come to reach the Temple of Issus and the side of the fair prisoner who languished there. But even as hope was at its highest, I felt the sudden shock of contact as my head struck the rocks above. The worst, then, had come to me. I had reached one of those rare places where a Martian tunnel dips suddenly to a lower level. Somewhere beyond, I knew that it rose again, but of what value was that to me, since I did not know how great the distance that it maintained a level entirely beneath the surface of the water? There was but a single forlorn hope, and I took it. Filling my lungs with air, I dived beneath the surface and swam through the inky, icy blackness on and on along the submerged gallery. Time and time again I rose with upstretched hand, only to feel the disappointing rocks close above me. Not for much longer would my lungs withstand the strain upon them. I felt that I must soon succumb, nor was there any retreating now that I had gone this far. I knew positively that I could never endure to retrace my path now to the point from which I had felt the waters close above my head. Death stared me in the face, nor ever can I recall a time that I so distinctly felt the icy breath from his dead lips upon my brow. One more frantic effort I made with my fast, ebbing strength. Weakly, I rose for the last time. My tortured lungs gasped for the breath that would fill them with a strange and numbing element, but instead... I felt the revivifying breath of life-giving air surge through my starving nostrils into my dying lungs. I was saved. A few more strokes brought me to a point where my feet touched the floor, and soon thereafter I was above the water level entirely, and racing like mad along the corridor searching for the first doorway that would lead me to Issus. If I could not have Deja Thoris again, I was at least determined to avenge her death, nor would any life satisfy me other than that of the fiend incarnate who was the cause of such immeasurable suffering upon Barsoom. Sooner than I had expected, I came to what appeared to me to be a sudden exit into the temple above. It was at the right side of the corridor, which ran on, probably, to other entrances to the pile above. To me, one point was as good as another. What knew I where any of them led? And so, without waiting to be again discovered and thwarted, I ran quickly up the short, steep incline and pushed open the doorway at its end. The portal swung slowly in, and before it could be slammed against me, I sprang into the chamber beyond. Although not yet dawn, the room was brilliantly lighted. Its sole occupant lay prone upon a low couch at the further side, apparently in sleep. From the hangings and sumptuous furniture of the room, I judged it to be a living room of some priestess, possibly of Issus herself. At the thought the blood tingled through my veins. What indeed, if fortune had been kind enough to place the hideous creature alone and unguarded in my hands? With her as hostage, I could force acquiescence to my every demand. Cautiously, I approached the recumbent figure on noiseless feet. 
Closer and closer I came to it, but I had crossed but little more than half the chamber when the figure stirred, and as I sprang, rose and faced me. At first an expression of terror overspread the features of the woman who confronted me, then startled incredulity, hope, thanksgiving. My heart pounded within my breast as I advanced toward her. Tears came to my eyes, and the words that would have poured forth in a perfect torrent choked in my throat as I opened my arms and took into them once more the woman I loved, Deja Thoris, Princess of Helium. Chapter 22 Victory and Defeat John Carter, John Carter, she sobbed, with her dear head upon my shoulder. Even now I can scarce believe the witness of my own eyes. When the girl, Thuvia, told me that you had returned to Barsoom, I listened, but I could not understand, for it seemed that such happiness would be impossible for one who had suffered so in silent loneliness for all these long years. At last, when I realized that it was truth, and then came to know the awful place in which I was held prisoner, I learned to doubt that even you could reach me here. As the days passed, and moon after moon went by without bringing even the faintest rumor of you, I resigned myself to my fate, and now that you have come, scarce can I believe it. For an hour I have heard the sounds of conflict within the palace. I knew not what they meant, but I have hoped against hope that it might be the men of Helium headed by my prince. And tell me, what of Carthoris, our son? He was with me less than an hour since, Dejah Thoris, I replied. It must have been he whose men you have heard battling within the precincts of the temple. Where is Issus? I asked suddenly. Dejah Thoris shrugged her shoulders. She sent me under guard to this room just before the fighting began within the temple halls. She said that she would send for me later, she seemed very angry and somewhat fearful. Never have I seen her act in so uncertain and almost terrified a manner. Now I know that it must have been because she had learned that John Carter, Prince of Helium, was approaching to demand an accounting of her for the imprisonment of his princess. The sounds of conflict, the clash of arms, the shouting and the hurrying of many feet came to us from various parts of the temple. I knew that I was needed there, but I dared not leave Deja Thoris, nor dared I take her with me into the turmoil and danger of battle. At last I bethought me of the pits from which I had just emerged. Why not secrete her there until I could return and fetch her away in safety and forever from this awful place? I explained my plan to her. For a moment she clung more closely to me. I cannot bear to be parted from you now, even for a moment, John Carter, she said. I shudder at the thought of being alone again, where that terrible creature might discover me. You do not know her. None can imagine her ferocious cruelty who has not witnessed her daily acts for over half a year. It has taken me nearly all this time to realize even the things that I have seen with my own eyes. I shall not leave you then, my princess, I replied. She was silent for a moment, then she drew my face to hers and kissed me. Go, John Carter, she said. Our son is there, and the soldiers of Helium, fighting for the princess of Helium. Where they are, you should be. I must not think of myself now, but of them, and of my husband's duty. I may not stand in the way of that. Hide me in the pits, and go. I led her to the door through which I had entered the chamber from below. There I pressed her dear form to me, and then, though it tore my heart to do it, and filled me only with the blackest shadows of terrible foreboding, I guided her across the threshold, kissed her once again, and closed the door upon her. Without hesitating longer, I hurried from the chamber in the direction of the greatest tumult. Scarce half a dozen chambers had I traversed before I came upon the theatre of a fierce struggle. The blacks were massed at the entrance to a great chamber where they were attempting to block the further progress of a body of red men toward the inner sacred precincts of the temple. Coming from within as I did, I found myself behind the blacks, and without waiting to even calculate their numbers or the foolhardiness of my venture, I charged swiftly across the chamber and fell upon them from the rear with my keen longsword. As I struck the first blow, I cried aloud, For Helium! 
and then I rained cut after cut upon the surprised warriors, while the Reds without took heart at the sound of my voice, and with shouts of, John Carter, John Carter, redoubled their efforts so effectually that before the blacks could recover from their temporary demoralization, their ranks were broken, and the Red men had burst into the chamber. The fight within that room, had it had but a competent chronicler, would go down in the annals of Barsoom as a historic memorial to the grim ferocity of her warlike people. Five hundred men fought there that day, the black men against the red. No man asked quarter or gave it. As though by common assent, they fought, as though to determine once and for all their right to live in accordance with the law of the survival of the fittest. I think we all knew that upon the outcome of this battle would hinge forever the relative positions of these two races upon Barsoom. It was a battle between the old and the new, but not for once did I question the outcome of it. With Carthoris at my side, I fought for the red men of Barsoom and for their total emancipation from the throttling bondage of a hideous superstition. Back and forth across the room, we surged until the floor was ankle deep in blood and dead men lay so thickly there that half the time we stood upon their bodies as we fought. As we swung toward the great windows which overlooked the gardens of Issus, a sight met my gaze which sent a wave of exultation over me. Look, I cried, men of the firstborn, look! For an instant the fighting ceased, and with one accord every eye turned in the direction I had indicated, and the sight they saw was one no man of the firstborn had ever imagined could be. Across the gardens, from side to side, stood a wavering line of black warriors, while beyond them, and forcing them ever back, was a great horde of green warriors astride their mighty thoats. And as we watched, one, fiercer and more grimly terrible than his fellows, rode forward from the rear, and as he came, he shouted some fierce command to his terrible legion. It was Tars Tarkas, Jeddak of Thark, and as he couched his great forty-foot metal-shod lance, we saw his warriors do likewise. Then it was that we interpreted his command. Twenty yards now separated the green men from the black line. Another word from the great Thark, and with a wild and terrifying battle cry, the green warriors charged. For a moment the black line held, but only for a moment. Then the fearsome beasts that bore equally terrible riders passed completely through it. After them came Utan upon Utan of red men. The green horde broke to surround the temple. The red men charged for the interior, and then we turned to continue our interrupted battle. But our foes had vanished. My first thought was of Deja Thoris. Calling to Carthoris that I had found his mother, I started on a run toward the chamber where I had left her, with my boy close beside me. After us came those of our little force who had survived the bloody conflict. The moment I entered the room, I saw that someone had been there since I had left. A silk lay upon the floor. It had not been there before. There were also a dagger and several metal ornaments strewn about, as though torn from their wearer in a struggle. But worst of all, the door leading to the pits where I had hidden my princess was ajar. With a bound I was before it, and thrusting it open, rushed within. Deja Thoris had vanished. I called her name aloud again and again, but there was no response. I think in that instant I hovered upon the verge of insanity. I do not recall what I said or did, but I know that for an instant I was seized with the rage of a maniac. Issus! I cried. Issus! Where is Issus? Search the temple for her, but let no man harm her but John Carter. Carthoris, where are the apartments of Issus? This way, cried the boy, and without waiting to know that I had heard him, he dashed off at breakneck speed, further into the bowels of the temple. As fast as he went, however, I was still beside him, urging him on to greater speed. At last we came to a great carved door, and through this Carthoris dashed, a foot ahead of me. Within, we came upon such a scene as I had witnessed within the temple once before, the throne of Issus, with the reclining slaves, and about it the ranks of soldiery. We did not even give the men a chance to draw, so quickly were we upon them. With a single cut I struck down two in the front rank, 
and then, by the mere weight and momentum of my body, I rushed completely through the two remaining ranks and sprang upon the dais beside the carved Serapis throne. The repulsive creature, squatting there in terror, attempted to escape me and leap into a trap behind her. But this time, I was not to be outwitted by any such petty subterfuge. Before she had half arisen, I had grasped her by the arm, and then, as I saw the guards starting to make a concerted rush upon me from all sides, I whipped out my dagger, and holding it close to that vile breast, ordered them to halt. Back! I cried to them. Back! The first black foot that is planted upon this platform sends my dagger into Issus's heart. For an instant, they hesitated. Then an officer ordered them back, while from the outer corridor there swept into the throne room at the heels of my little party of survivors a full thousand red men under Kantos Khan, Horvastus, and Xodar. Where is Deja Thoris? I cried to the thing within my hands. For a moment her eyes roved wildly about the scene beneath her. I think that it took a moment for the true condition to make any impression upon her. She could not at first realize that the temple had fallen before the assault of men of the outer world. When she did, there must have come, too, a terrible realization of what it meant to her. The loss of power, humiliation, the exposure of the fraud and imposture which she had for so long played upon her own people. There was just one thing needed to complete the reality of the picture she was seeing, and that was added by the highest noble of her realm, the high priest of her religion, the Prime Minister of her government. Issus, goddess of death and of life eternal, he cried, arise in the might of thy righteous wrath, and with one single wave of thy omnipotent hand strike dead thy blasphemers. Let not one escape. Issus, thy people depend upon thee. Daughter of the lesser moon, thou only art all-powerful. Thou only canst save thy people. I am done. We await thy will. Strike! And then it was that she went mad. A screaming, gibbering maniac writhed in my grasp. It bit and clawed and scratched in impotent fury. And then it laughed a weird and terrible laughter that froze the blood. The slave girls upon the dais shrieked and cowered away. And the thing jumped at them and gnashed its teeth and then spat upon them from frothing lips. God! But it was a horrid sight. Finally, I shook the thing hoping to recall it for a moment to rationality. Where is Deja Thoris? I cried again. The awful creature in my grasp mumbled inarticulately for a moment, then a sudden gleam of cunning shot into those hideous, close-set eyes. Deja Thoris? Deja Thoris? And then that shrill, unearthly laugh pierced our ears once more. Yes, Deja Thoris, I know. And Thuvia and Fida, daughter of Matai Shang, They each love John Carter. Ha! Ha! But it is droll. Together for a year, they will meditate within the Temple of the Sun. But ere the year is quite gone, there will be no more food for them. Ho! Oh! What divine entertainment! And she licked the froth from her cruel lips. There will be no more food except each other. Ha! 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 The horror of the suggestion nearly paralyzed me. To this awful fate, the creature within my power had condemned my princess. I trembled in the ferocity of my rage. As a terrier shakes a rat, I shook Issus, goddess of life eternal. Countermand your orders, I cried. Recall the condemned. Haste, or you die. It is too late. Ha, ah, ha, ah. And then she commenced her gibbering and shrieking again. Almost of its own volition, my dagger flew up above that putrid heart. But something stayed my hand, and I am now glad that it did. It were a terrible thing to have struck down a woman with one's own hand. But a fitter fate occurred to me for this false deity. Firstborn, I cried, turning to those who stood within the chamber. You have seen today the impotency of Issus. The gods are impotent. Issus is no god. She is a cruel and wicked old woman who has deceived and played upon you for ages. Take her. John Carter, Prince of Helium, would not contaminate his hand with her blood. And with that, I pushed the raving beast, whom a short half-hour before a whole world had worshipped as divine, from the platform of her throne 
into the waiting clutches of her betrayed and vengeful people. Spying Zodar among the officers of the Red Men, I called him to lead me quickly to the Temple of the Sun, and without waiting to learn what fate the firstborn would wreak upon their goddess, I rushed from the chamber with Zodar, Carthoris, Horvastus, Kantos Khan, and a score of other Red Nobles. The Black led us rapidly through the inner chambers of the temple until we stood within the central court, a great circular space paved with a transparent marble of exquisite whiteness. Before us rose a golden temple wrought in the most wondrous and fanciful designs, inlaid with diamond, ruby, sapphire, turquoise, emerald, and the thousand nameless gems of Mars, which far transcend in loveliness and purity of ray the most priceless stones of earth. This way! cried Zodar, leading us toward the entrance to a tunnel which opened in the courtyard beside the temple. Just as we were on the point of descending, we heard a deep-toned roar burst from the Temple of Issus, which we had but just quitted, and then a red man, Jor Kantos, Padwar of the Fifth Utan, broke from a nearby gate, crying to us to return. "'The blacks have fired the temple,' he cried. "'In a thousand places. It is burning now. Haste to the outer gardens, or you are lost. As he spoke, we saw smoke pouring from a dozen windows looking out upon the courtyard of the Temple of the Sun, and far above the highest minaret of Issus hung an ever-growing pall of smoke. Go back, go back, I cried to those who had accompanied me. The way, Zodar, point the way and leave me. I shall reach my princess yet. Follow me, John Carter, replied Zodar and without waiting for my reply, he dashed down into the tunnel at our feet. At his heels, I ran down through a half-dozen tiers of galleries, until at last he led me along a level floor at the end of which I discerned a lighted chamber. Massive bars blocked our further progress, but beyond I saw her, my incomparable princess, and with her were Thuvia and Fidor. When she saw me, she rushed toward the bars that separated us, Already the chamber had turned upon its slow way so far that but a portion of the opening in the temple wall was opposite the barred end of the corridor. Slowly, the interval was closing. In a short time, there would be but a tiny crack, and then even that would be closed, and for a long Barsoomian year the chamber would slowly revolve until once more, for a brief day, the aperture in its wall would pass the corridor's end. But in the meantime... What horrible things would go on within that chamber? Xodar, I cried, can no power stop this awful revolving thing? Is there none who holds the secret of these terrible bars? None, I fear, whom we could fetch in time, though I shall go and make the attempt. Wait for me here. After he had left, I stood and talked with Deja Thoris, and she stretched her dear hand through those cruel bars that I might hold it until the last moment. Thuvia and Fidor came close also, but when Thuvia saw that we would be alone, she withdrew to the further side of the chamber. Not so the daughter of Matai Shang. John Carter, she said, this be the last time that you shall see any of us. Tell me that you love me, that I may die happy. I love only the Princess of Helium, I replied quietly. I am sorry, Fidor, but it is as I have told you from the beginning. She bit her lip and turned away, but not before I saw the black and ugly scowl she turned upon Deja Thoris. Thereafter she stood a little way apart, but not so far as I should have desired, for I had many little confidences to impart to my long-lost love. For a few minutes we stood thus talking in low tones. Ever smaller and smaller grew the opening. In a short time now it would be too small even to permit the slender form of my princess to pass. Oh, why did not Zodar haste? Above, we could hear the faint echoes of a great tumult. It was the multitude of black and red and green men fighting their way through the fire from the burning temple of Issus. A draught from above brought the fumes of smoke to our nostrils. As we stood waiting for Zodar, the smoke became thicker and thicker. Presently, we heard shouting at the far end of the corridor and hurrying feet. Come back, John Carter, come back, cried a voice. Even the pits are burning. In a moment, a dozen men broke through the now blinding smoke to my side. 
There was Carthoris, and Cantos Khan, and Hor Vastus, and Zodar, with a few more who had followed me to the temple court. There is no hope, John Carter, cried Zodar. The keeper of the keys is dead, and his keys are not upon his carcass. Our only hope is to quench this conflagration, and trust to fate that a year will find your princess alive and well. I have brought sufficient food to last them. When this crack closes, no smoke can reach them, and if we hasten to extinguish the flames, I believe they will be safe. Go then yourself and take these others with you, I replied. I shall remain here beside my princess until a merciful death releases me from my anguish. I care not to live. As I spoke, Zodar had been tossing a great number of tiny cans within the prison cell. The remaining crack was not over an inch in width a moment later. Dejah Thoris stood as close to it as she could, whispering words of hope and courage to me and urging me to save myself. Suddenly, beyond her, I saw the beautiful face of Fidor contorted into an expression of malign hatred. As my eyes met hers, she spoke. Think not, John Carter, that you may so lightly cast aside the love of Fidor, daughter of Matai Shang, nor ever hope to hold thy Deja Thoris in thy arms again. Wait you the long, long year, but know that when the waiting is over, it shall be Fidor's arms which shall welcome you not those of the Princess of Helium. Behold, she dies. And as she finished speaking, I saw her raise a dagger on high, and then I saw another figure. It was Thuvia's. As the dagger fell toward the unprotected breast of my love, Thuvia was almost between them. A blinding gust of smoke blotted out the tragedy within that fearsome cell. A shriek rang out, a single shriek as the dagger fell. The smoke cleared away but we stood gazing upon a blank wall. The last crevice had closed, and for a long year that hideous chamber would retain its secret from the eyes of men. They urged me to leave. In a moment it will be too late, cried Zodar. There is, in fact, but a bare chance that we can come through to the outer garden alive even now. I have ordered the pumps started, and in five minutes the pits will be flooded. If we would not drown like rats in a trap, we must hasten above and make a dash for safety through the burning temple. Go, I urged them. Let me die here beside my princess. There is no hope or happiness elsewhere for me. When they carry her dear body from that terrible place, a year hence, let them find the body of her lord awaiting her. Of what happened after that, I have only a confused recollection. It seems as though I struggled with many men, and then that I was picked bodily from the ground and borne away. I do not know. I have never asked, nor has any other who was there that day intruded on my sorrow or recalled to my mind the occurrences which they know could but at best reopen the terrible wound within my heart. Ah, if I could but know one thing, what a burden of suspense would be lifted from my shoulders but whether the assassin's dagger reached one fair bosom or another, only time will divulge. Hey sci-fi horror fans, that concludes The Gods of Mars. Make sure to subscribe so you won't miss the final installment in this series, A Warlord of Mars, which will come out next Saturday, October 14th. If you enjoyed this story, make sure to give it a thumbs up. A huge shout-out goes to our official members of the channel, we truly appreciate your support. Craving for another classic sci-fi tale? Click that video on your screen. Until next time, everyone. And remember, stay cosmic.